Okay, hello, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this very important moment of our project, uh, Erasmus Plus project. So thank you once again for, for being with us and sharing this unique moment of our like project life. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you remember the beginning of COVID? It was a very strange moment in our teaching lives, right? It was very, very strange and difficult. And I remember that feeling, that fear, that I won't be able to, to cover all those classes online. And then I met, I met Ada, and yes, and we well, we discussed what to do and how to you know, manage all this process at our university and how to organize this process. And then uh, we realized that the best way to, to learn is to learn from others. So we decided to apply for an Erasmus Plus project uh, and to organize peer learning activities. According to our experience, peer learning activity is always the best way to learn because there are always some people who uh, know a little bit more in one field and are very willing to share some experiences. So that's how this idea started. And today we have our hero, we meet at the very final stage of our project, uh, ECLOS project. But the title is quite long, I will tell you later on the background of this title. But I am very happy to, to be here with you and I am very happy that so many partners came today to share this unique moment with us. And let me introduce, let, let me welcome Professor Dr. Andy Juncker, the President of uh, University of Applied, okay, Vice President, <laughs> University of Applied High. And uh, Frank Ruckert from the same university, it was a project leader institutional coordinator from uh, University of Applied Sciences in Saarbrücken. Uh, Rosa um, Esliegena and Soraya Garcia Esteban from University of Alcala. Hello guys, good to have you here. Natalia Martinez and Paolo Cohim, uh, University of Aveiro, Portugal. Yeah. And of course, the big team from our uh, university, so Ada Kozłowska, the co-leader, Gertruda Gwuśćłukawska and Monika Poterawa, the work package coordinators, Agnieszka Roganowicz, <laughs> administrative coordinator, and uh, Małgosia Jarczyńska uh, and Ola Szmurlik Dominguez also coordinate. So now you know the whole team coordinating and I'm Dorota Piotrowska, a project leader, but also I'm head of International Faculty of Engineering International Cooperation Center uh, at our university. So thank you once again for coming here, for being, uh, be we, being with us. Okay, we have many, many topics to cover here, so let's dive in. First of all, it's not well visible, actually. Can we make it a little bit bigger, the picture? Can you see it? Have you received the program? Okay, so I will do my best to read, <laughs> and then... <laughs> ah. Okay, I need to go. Okay, so... We will start with some findings from our survey. We conducted at the very first stage of our project, we con conducted a survey uh, at different partner universities uh, because we wanted to learn about student perspective, about university authorities' perspective, about teachers' perspective as well. So, uh, so we started with um, not only desk research, but a real uh, research uh, among our academic, um, uh, well, uh, teachers, students, academic society. So first of all, we will share with you 
this experience. But before that, you will have a unique opportunity to listen to a very, very special, very special speech. And I will tell you more in one minute. Then in the afternoon, right after lunch, um, we would like you to participate in some more practical, practical activities. And covering all outputs of our project. So we will start with micro-credentials. This is a hot topic right now uh, in Europe, in European Commission. Uh, then, uh, of course, we would like you to um, work a little bit with our toolbox elaborated together. Um, as a, It was a real co-creation process of a toolbox presenting different uh, active methods, how to make this process, teaching and learning process, more efficient on both sides, like student side and also teacher side. Uh, then a uh, very important uh, topic will be covered by our colleagues from Germany, gamification in practice. So how to implement this gamification tips uh, into your classes. And uh, we uh, will also have an opportunity to work with Coffee Ideas uh, workshop. Coffee Ideas is about how to communicate more effectively, how to share different ex um, perspective, uh, perspectives and how to uh, and, and how to connect different dots, I would say. You will see this is also very interesting uh, output of our uh, experience from this project. Then uh, we will conclude with a very important perspective, a student perspective, student feedback uh, on um, what can we learn from students. Because for sure, uh, especially for this online learning, online teaching, there are some tips that you, we can learn from our students. So they agreed to, uh, to share uh, this lesson with us. So we will, as I said, conclude with this uh, um, recommendation session, um, recommendations coming from, from our students. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, uh, so I do hope we will manage quite challenging day for all of us, but I do hope it will be very fruitful uh, for all for all of you. Okay, now um, in a moment I will invite a very special person, an extraordinary person. Um, this is one of those people who usually change your life, your way of thinking, your attitudes toward different things. And that was my moment of very important learning process when I met Janet. Uh, I had a great opportunity to work with Janet to uh, convert my different subject, not only one different subject, on a uh, well, more active uh, mode. Uh, so, let me say that I, I feel really honored and privileged because uh, Janet was um, a learning designer, an expert working in Queensland University in Australia. Now she moved to Ireland, uh, but she's also an expert working uh, with our university and introducing this uh, learning designing culture into our uh, university. So thank you very much, Jana, for coming, for being a part of this project, of this university teaching and learning culture. And the floor is yours. OK. Need a mic for Yeah, sure. Of course you need. Need some help? Can I have my timer? Yeah. Thank you. Is that a clicker? Yeah. Good. 
All right, Dorota, thank you very much. Dorota is a very humble and lovely person to work with. We made friends in the most unusual situations when we first met, um, actually through Aga, who came to visit University of Queensland when I was working there. And since then, our relationship and our collaboration has flourished. And I'm very honored, I am very honored to be here speaking to all of you, amazing work that you guys have been doing through this um, transitional and transformational times that we've been living since the pandemic, right? So let's see if my presser is working. <laughs> Not yet. <coughs> Which is yours? Uh, this one. This? Jinkly, uh, yes. Oh, Jinky. Jinky bottle. <laughs> and I come to Poland so often that I'm really trying to learn a little bit of Polish. <laughs> please forgive me about my pronunciation. And if I say anything wrong to any of my co Polish colleagues, please forgive me and correct me. I would really appreciate if you correct me. So I was invited here today and um, I am going to apologize for the cameraman. I know we are streaming and I like moving. So if you need me to be still, I'll be still. Um, I was invited here today to share a little bit about my experience uh, not being in Europe, um, what happened through the COVID times in the other side of the world. So uh, the, I love the title that they gave it to me to, to work with and I thought it was very fitting because it was certainly, it felt for the people who were on the ground trying to teach during the pandemic, it was certainly felt like an um, avalanche. I have... Um, a big session today, which I will try to not be just me talking at you. I'm actually going to put my timer so I can keep track of us and I don't talk too much. So I wanted to make today uh, a bit of me sharing two uh, case studies from two universities in Australia, both of them that I work with. And I wanted to take the last few parts for us to actually share some best practices, what we, we as individuals, when we are not talking about what our institutions are doing to help us through some challenges like this, what we can do. And last but not least, I want a completely interact, interactive um, session, uh, if we get the time, to talk about upcoming challenges, because now it feels like COVID is done, we, su we survived the COVID avalanche, but what's next, right? So let's hope we can make through this, but I will need your help. I'm not going to be doing this by myself. <laughs> okay, so a, a bit about me. So hi, I'm Janet Frizarin. Um, I've been working in education for the past 14, 15 years. Um, I started as, actually, before moving into education, I had 16 years career working in graphic design. So that was my first uh, uh, career. My first degree was I, I graduated in arts and worked in the design industry for 16 years. And I got to a point in my life that I wanted to do something that I could share my passion for design with other people. So I used to have obviously interns and younger people coming through my design studio, but I wanted to do a little bit more. And the first opportunity to teach happened when I uh, moved to Australia, I relocated to Australia. I'm not going to tell you where I'm originally from. You're going to have to guess. We're going to have this play at the end. You're going to have to give me a shout out where you think I'm from. Um, I started by teaching face to face. But after my one and a half year teaching face to face, I got an opportunity to teach online, purely online. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be amazing because, you know, purely online, how many more, teach my, how many more students I can reach. And the, the reality hit me in the face, literally, when I, my first day at the job, somebody handed me this big binds of printouts that we used to send to our students via the post. It was not online. <laughs> they told me it was online. It was not really. Coming from graphic design, where the, the digital had taken and turned uh, graphic design upside down, where technology was on the forefront of everything we do, and being faced with this was... I couldn't reconcile what I was looking with the proposition of online learning. As you can imagine, um, Australia is a big country, so a lot of students do remote 
uh, learning because not all of them are concentrated in the capitals. So, so uh, it is a, historically in Australia is a big thing, but I, I didn't understand that how behind it was in the use of technology for teaching, and that was uh, um, for me it was a great moment of enlightenment. To say like I can't leave. I, I wake up every day and I think about how can I make that student experience better, and that's what makes me tick. And since then, that's what I've been focused on. So. How did I get here? So um, Dorota said to me, like my background in, in learning design, I was actually not a learning designer. It was an I became an accidental learning designer because I was an academic. I wanted to improve the student experience. And I started using my design thinking, my design background to think about how can I engage my students? How can I uh, use technology better? How can I improve that learning experience on a day-to-day -day basis? And then what happened is, I started by doing my own, own course, then my program manager say, hey, your course is doing well, your students are much more engaged, you're getting better uh, uh, responses, and the students are passing the subject more. <laughs> Can you help us do the other courses in your program? So I was teaching a, a diploma in graphic design at the time. So I helped my colleagues. So we all together as a group did the whole program. And the program did very well, and the students started graduating and being more successful. And then the, the institution that I was working with was a college. Um, they said, well, you did well with the graphic design program. Would you like to do the interior design program and the photography program? And so that's how my career progressed. And it was completely accidental. I didn't plan for it, but it just happened, right? And then most recently, um, I've, I've been taking on roles where I do large digital transformation for large universities who are trying to embark on that journey, but there have been challenges because I think the main thing that people um, need to focus on is sometimes uh, there's a focus on the technology, or oh, we're going to start using this particular tool, or we're going to start using this particular methodology of delivery, and they forget that none of this will work unless we engage the people who will be delivering and using those tools or the delivery model. And that's where I think I, I can help university cross that bridge by supporting not only the technology side, the learning and teaching side, but also the academic development and uh, working with uh, the teams that will be working on it. So the first case study that I wanted to share with you is um, my time at the University of Queensland. So Dorota mentioned that that's when we met. Um, I joined the University of Queensland in 2018. And I was there to uh, help the university move their courses into blended and active learning. That was the program that I was leading, right? I wasn't doing that by myself. I had a team of people working with me. But Queensland University, if you haven't heard about it, is a highly ranked university. It's in the top 50 in the world. It is highly research uh, focused. As you can imagine, highly research focused university means not so much contemporary teaching happening, very traditional academia. So there was a big challenge on moving the university into a blended model where you were supposed to then reduce the time of contact via lectures, which was what I'm doing to you now, but obviously a lot of academics still love doing it. But for the student's point of view, a bit more outdated methodology, right? Um, University of Queensland has over 50,000 students, and, and I, I wanted to pay attention here the number of international students. So during COVID, what happened? Australia closed the borders. Australia was actually isolated from the rest of the world for pretty much two years. I was living in Australia, I couldn't leave, and I couldn't come back in if I left. It was really fascinating time to be in Australia. We already very isolated from the rest of the world normally, right? In COVID times, it felt like we were in another planet. It's really bizarre. But I want you to pay attention to that number because that was going to make a difference for the way um, uh, University of Queensland had to respond quickly to that. So literally what happened was during COVID, it, they had one week to move all the courses that they deliver, and they currently deliver over 3,000 courses into online. All good and dandy if you were a, a very contemporary university, but when majority of your classes are lectures in big lecture halls for thousands of students at a time, 
it was a big challenge for them. So the blended model that I was there to deliver um, was based on um, some principles. The idea was the courses that were coming through my program will be transformed by moving majority of the content in the, to the digital space, to online digital space. Um, but they will be highly integrated. The idea was uh, that by design, we were going to take the content transmission from the lecture hall like this and put the content out of the way in the digital space and create space in what used to be the passive lectures into high quality online content. So high investment here. The university was actually investing quite a lot into transforming these courses and improving the content quality that was going to be put online. So there were vid media production, video production, audio, podcast. It was high, highly invest high investment here. And the purpose was to open space in the class for high value active uh, act activities between the academics and the students and between the peers. And you would say, well, the university is investing a lot of money people will be throwing themselves at going through this process because they're getting so much support. They had a learning designer, they had someone to help them with recording the videos and stuff. But reality is, everything that is new is scary. I used to work with academics who would tell me, but I've been teaching for 20 years, why do I need to change? And it was difficult. It was really, really hard to actually get people engaged to come and participate of my program. The design methodology that uh, UQ2 was the name of the program. Sorry, I just realized this is the first time that you're seeing the name. It's, it was the name of the program, UQ2U. The point where I was trying to uh, convey to my academics was I, we were not there to take over their teaching. We wanted to combine their subject matter expertise with my team of learning designers who are professionals in helping them rethink about the structure of the course to collaborate in this project and they put the student at the center of their delivery. So a few things that we had as a methodology base was the pedagogy would come first and the learning spaces will also have to adapt. As you can imagine, if I, cha if I change my classes for active learning, this type of setup doesn't quite, is not conducive for the work that we want to do. So we move to um, flat floor collaborative spaces, right? We wanted to expand the presence in the online and the digital space, so again, the high production multimedia thing. We wanted to uh, enable the students to be transformed into game change graduates, and that was enabled by authentic assessments. So moving away to the traditional all exams type of assessments to more authentic assessments where, where the skills of the students could be demonstrated in, in different ways, giving them some really real world tasks to solve. And last but not least, develop the academic practice because we were asking fundamentally the academics to change what they do in the classroom. So we needed to support them through their journey so they could find their own voice. We didn't want them to be all the same or standardize the delivery. What we wanted them to find is what suits them, how they could deliver uh, differently. So the programming numbers was, it, over three years, we redeveloped 78 courses. So if you think about the 3,000 courses that the university has, three th 78 is nothing, right? It's nothing. But we focused on the largest courses. So as you can imagine, a few challenges came with that because majority of the largest courses are the first year courses. So I had um, physics, chemi chemistry, mathematics. So those baseline uh, uh, foundational courses for m many degrees where sometimes uh, one academic was teaching a thousand students in the classroom. So additional challenge on actually how you make it a, a blended and active learning in that setting. We had uh, over 800 staff and students um, participating in the program. As part of the program, we had uh, four students per course working with academic, helping co-create their, their content and co-create their assessments. Um, we reached out beyond 50,000 enrollments. So as you can imagine, each student enrolled in more than one course every semester. So we had 50,000 of them enrolled in UQTU course. And the numbers, the result of that was actually quite staggering because the failure rate had decreased in average by 7.5%, 7.8%. And the attrition rate, the number of students that were giving up on their courses halfway through also decreased by nearly 10%. So it was quite impressive results, right? 
But then the pandemic hit. And what happened was the academics who had been part of the program, they reported the following experience. So because they already had the high quality content online, the course was already designed and available for the students. They found that their one week turnaround to move from face to face setting to online, it was actually pr pretty smooth. They didn't have to recreate content. The content was already there for them. They were already there for the students, right? Because in tandem with the content online, they had already developed online activities for the students to do and, and self-regulate their learning. They also felt that the data that they could get, so the quizzes, the small quizzes that they had or any activity or discussion forums that had already planned for the students gave them data to make those students visible because there was nothing worse for us than through the pandemic. The students were invisible, right? We suddenly, I can see all of you here, I know if you're happy or sad, if you're upset, if you're quiet, if you're chatting, but when they are online, you don't see them. So how do you keep track on how they are progressing? So this was uh, insightful for the academics who had their learning platform already set up. Because then the content transmission was online and in class they had already planned activities. Moving the planned activities from this setting to a Zoom session wasn't that hard. They had already planned for it. The students already kind of knew what was coming. Um, and last but not least, the authentic assessments also facilitated for the students to continue to engage with the assessment without having to be in an invigilated, <coughs> excuse me, in the invigilated setting for an exam or anything like that. So from the students' point of view, because that's the part that we are actually interested, isn't it? Well, how did the students feel about this? For the students' point of view, um, the ones that responded to the survey, because obviously not all of them do, <clears throat> but the online course structure, it was already there, it was already in place, it already helped them guide themselves into how to follow the flow of their courses. Because they did have those online activities at, the finger, at their fingerprints, they themselves could say, how am I tracking? Oh, I'm completely off track here, I probably need to go back and rewatch that video or revisit those slides because they knew themselves how they were going, because the online activities give them instant feedback. They didn't depend to be talking to an academic in a classroom. <coughs> because during the scheduled Zoom sessions now, they have activities. They felt more motivated to join than the ones that they just sat passively listening to someone talking at them. They really felt more engaged. And they also help um, keep contact with their colleagues, with their peers. They also felt that they were closer to them because they got to have lots of collaborative time and exchanging ideas with the other peer students. And last but not least, the assessments was easier to submit, easier to work on because they were not an exam that they had to do in a proctor environment um, because a lot of those assessments are also collaborative and teamwork. So again, a way to keep in contact with their peers. They didn't, didn't feel so isolated as they felt in other uh, courses. So the outcomes of all of that was um, we got granted an extension of the program for further three years <laughs> because at the beginning nobody knew if that was going to work out, if it was going to fly. And uh, the capacity increased to 100 courses per year. So remember I was doing 78 courses over, 100, uh, over three years and now I'm doing 100 in one year. So it was massive. <coughs> oh, that sounds dancy. No. Um, and then finally, the academics were actually willing to engage because they thought, oh my God, all my colleagues did this was such a smooth transition from face to face to online. I want to be part of this because I don't want to be in this situation ever again because it was scary times, right? It was scary times. <sighs> so yeah, so that was a fun time to be at UQ. So now I'm going to share a slightly different take, but I'm going to take a break on it and get a sip of water. And I'm going to give you the chance to see, would you like to ask any question about UQ? their situation, their students, anyone? No? <laughs> Are you not going to ask me a question? No? <laughs> Nobody was going to ask me a question, of course. Yes, that's, that's mine. This one is mine, <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're trying to steal my laptop. Yes, please.
Yeah, so, so when I arrived there, all that I did have at the time was a figure, a dollar figure and a budget. And I was in like, I, I got brought in really to really think what the model would be. How would we make this work? How can we deliver this many courses in this period of time within this budget? What type of skill set do we need? <clears throat> so bringing the learning designers or multimedia people. So um, that was part of why I got there, was to help that out. Uh, beyond all the work that we did with the academics one-to-one, -one, there was all the work in terms of change management at the university level, uh, involving the ex executive of each one of the faculties to be part of it, and then, again, um, making sure that the resources were appropriated, allocated. So, yeah, there was a, a, a bit of work in the background as well. Yeah. I'll be happy to chat with you the, the details if you're interested later. <laughs> I'm not going to bore these people because uh, that part is the... It's the crux of the work, but it definitely is not int so interesting for the academics. But. Okay. So, I was there at UQ at the time. My program got extended. I worked on the new strategy and how to roll that out, the, that extension. However, I was approached to another, by another university, also in Queensland. And um, it was a, a slightly different challenge, and I love a challenge. So, I thought I will take that opportunity. So I moved to Griffith University. Griffith University is slightly different profile than Queensland University, University of Queensland. Still highly ranked, but as you can see here, not on the top 50. They are on the top between 200, 300, a little bit lower in the ranking. Very different profile of students. University of Queensland, high profile, high, uh, highly regarded means they attract high performance students. So. I find, and I probably all your academics here find the same, when you have high performance students, it's much easier because they are engaged to get on with. Griffith University actually caters for the students who are first in family going to university, the students who mostly work full time to support their studies. Um, funding in Australia for universities is slightly different than in Europe. The students pay for the university, but it's funded by the government up front, and the students repay the government as they find uh, a job and, and uh, uh, achieve a certain threshold of salary later. Again, I wanted to show you here at the scale. It's still a very big university, nearly 50,000 students, a little bit smaller than UQ. However, look at the percentage of the international students, much smaller. So as you can imagine, the challenge here, it was slightly different than, than UQ, because UQ, when the borders shut, none of the international students could come to Australia. So the only way that they could continue the study was online. So they had to make the hard call of move everything online. For this university, it was slightly different. They could have a little bit more flexibility, because with the borders closed in Australia, it meant that we had much more freedom of movement within the country. So our times of lockdown, especially in the state of Queensland, were much shorter. So really early on, students were actually able, probably towards the end of 2020, students were actually able to come back to class if they wished to. So Griffith decided to look into the opportunity to move into hybrid teaching. I want to ask around, Anybody familiar? Anybody doing hybrid teaching? Yes, maybe, <laughs> maybe, okay. So the concept for Griffith was they wanted to give the students opportunity to attend any classroom, either face-to-face -face or online, and they were simultaneous. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, what happened is the academics were sitting in the, in the classroom with some students, and then they were going to their offices and deliver the classroom online all over again. That was not sustainable long term, so they thought, how can we make it work that the teacher is delivering class for face-to-face -face and online students at the same time? So you might say, well, but Janet, we have some people watching online. Hello, people watching online. Um, not quite the same thing, because they are very passive. They can't interact with me. They, Griffith wanted to make that experience interactive. So the hybrid principles for Griffith University was they wanted to provide an equivalent learning experience for the classroom and the online students. So they had to be both visible and interactive all the time. 
They wanted to enable the collaboration between the in-person students and the online students. And they wanted to empower the academics here to deliver exceptional learning experiences. And what does that mean? Because, oh, that's why I'm always delivering exceptional learning experiences. But what does that mean is they wanted the academics to be um, part of the process, not just a... Uh, 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 technical <laughs> because as you can imagine when you're trying to do two things at the same time it becomes quite mechanical and it's, it's no longer about the people and we wanted to bring the academics on that journey on how again finding the right pedagogy how the finding the, the optimum course model that would work for them on that delivery model so once again collaboration between academics learning designers and now I had the ad additional level of the AV technical people, as you can imagine, the people who are in the room trying to help us select what would be the best equipment that you have to have in a room where you want the students to be visible and audible all the time. So that was very interesting. I am not a technical technology, you know, hardware person. So having a, a great team uh, to support me through that journey was very important. Um, but we needed to design those activities. We needed to develop the teaching practices. We needed to support the academics through uh, being familiar enough with the tools. They didn't have to be thinking about what they are doing when what, so they could still have a natural delivery of the course. And obviously install the appropriate equipment. So as you can imagine, we had to have in the classroom uh, microphones that everybody could speak and be heard, and the online people could hear them. But we couldn't have ho roving microphones like this because it's COVID, right? So we couldn't be passing the microphone hand to hand. So we had to think about what creative solution we have to have. So again, very interesting times. So what this hybrid courses experience ended up looking like? I'm not sure if you can see or re read what is there, apologies. So I'll try to read it out for you. So the academics who were teaching in the hybrid model um, they responded that professional development, some specific professional development opportunities were much more important than uh, anything else that they were doing. So, for example, understanding the challenges of hybrid delivery. Because, as you can imagine, that's not natural for us. We haven't been doing this before, so we wanted to understand what were the difficulties that we knew we were potentially going to face, right? Um, community of practice. So, I think similar to the the e closed project where you actually get together with other people and see what is working for you. Let's exchange some of that experience and learning for each other because that is a, it was new for everybody, right? Um, constructive alignment, how to design course following the constructive alignment. Lesson planning, so all of these things. So as you can see, you had the, the blue, the large blue bars means the things that they actually felt, this is valuable, this was valuable, right? I will make sure that you guys get the slides because I didn't realize it was getting so blurry on the screen. So apologies for that. Um, they, they also self-identified what types of learning activities worked better than others. Remember, we were not trying to standardize that every class had to do exactly the same type of things. So the academics got to choose what worked for them, what worked for their students, what worked for their delivery. So as you can see here, obviously, preference, and this is quite telling on how it was a progress, a slow progress into new thinking, the teacher-led activities that students did individually worked very well. Because that's what they used to do, right? So that was very straightforward. When you go to the ones below, when it's a group activities that combined online students and in-person students, there's a big red bar there which means a lot of them didn't even go close to that type of activity. It was too big of a jump for them to move from where they were to that. Not saying that they won't try it again, but as you can imagine, it is challenging. We are changing things. The next thing was group activities were kept the online students and the in-person students separate. So I will break the room, the students here will do something, the students online will group into a breakout room and they will work together. There you can see it was a little bit more, um, more used and mostly successful because that felt a little bit more comfortable. We were all used to teach face to face first and then when we moved to online we all used to use breakout rooms. So, okay, I feel comfortable with that. That's going to be easy. And it did work. And then pre and post class activities that were reviewed in class. And then this was something that we were trying to push based on the results from the blended learning model from UQ 
um, I was trying to bring that experience to the academics at Griffith. So they could use some of the content transmission out of the way, give the students that content online. But as you can see here, not many of them did first round. So this is the first time ever they delivered. Right? This is this results are for the first trimester. Now, from the students' point of view, who were in, the students who were enrolled, they said at 70% they reported they would likely prefer enrolling into a hybrid course in the future. And um, they also said they prefer the hybrid model than, more than just face-to-face -face or just online. Because it gives them flexibility, it gives them choice, it gives them an opportunity for the days that they do have a work schedule, they can still attend the class without having to commute to campus. So these are the, the, the two very different cases, but I think there's a few things that we wanted to highlight here, is how uh, both of them were trying to think about what the students need from now on, right? So. This is what I wanted to jump into the next thing. But before that, I would like to hear a little bit about anybody interested in hybrid learning, because I would be delighted to chat with a few people later if you are, or if your institute, you know your institution is going to be looking into that in the future. Anyone? Other? <laughs> awesome. We will catch up later. OK. So. This is the part that I'm going to hopefully have a bit of a, a bit more interaction with you all. Um, we are all here today. What brought us together was we are going through these challenges together. And you were telling me, oh, Jenna, this is all good and dandy. You work in this big university with lots of bucks, investing in the change in the delivery. But what can I do as an individual? Or what can I do as a program manager? How can I support my teachers? What can I do to help my students, right? So this is why we are here. I would like to start with a very, very, very basic quote that I love from the late Sir Ken Robinson. I want to show hands, who ever heard of Sir Ken Robinson here? A few of you, excellent. Excellent, I love the enthusiasm. Yay, I am a fan too, I am a fan. So if you haven't ever looked into his work, uh, his past, but um, he is a very contemporary of us, British uh, educationalist, um, and he wrote a few books. He had one very famous and a bit old TED talk about education that is absolutely inspirational. So those days that you feel as an academic this is hard, go and watch that TED talk. It will give you a good pick, pick me up. But I love this, I love, I love this um, quote. The task of education is not to teach subjects, it's to teach students. We sometimes get caught on the day-to-day -day running of everything that we do, and sometimes it's even more admin than it is the practice of teaching, that we forget about that. It's so, so important. <laughs> And the way I see how can we as individuals change, adapt, grow, challenge ourselves, and re-engage our students is really thinking about who are our students? Who are they? And what are they needing from us now, right? Obviously, different um, students, different motivations. Uh, you can have a, a, a peak of different personas that come to your classroom. But for the people who, like me, have been teaching for a very long time, you know your students well. You know what they do. You know how they are. I know how, um, what they need from us, right? So I'm going to share a few data with you, which is actually, I wanted to highlight this as pre-pandemic data. Because as you can imagine, this has progressed since then. So. In Queensland, they did an undergraduate student survey asking our students, how many hours a week do you work? And we still have a high percentage of the students who don't work at all. They only dedicated their time to come to the university. But reality is, majority of the students are now work in some capacity. They are not, not only studying full time anymore. They have to share their uh, time with uh, university, attending class, working, studying, sometimes caring, caring from a family member, caring from 
children. We have lots of uh, mature age students coming back to retrain in university, and I will be fascinated to be part of the micro-credential um, workshop later because this is very topical exactly because of that, because people continue to need retraining. The nature of jobs is changing faster than the nature of university programs. So they are constantly trying to find ways to reskill um, and keep up and keep employed and progress in their careers if they have to cho so choose. So this, I'm oh, sorry, this is a screenshot from uh, a presentation that I've been the other day from uh, Gartner and the competition for students. So again, is thinking about our students, how there are different students' different needs uh, enhance the competition for students. So they are saying here, the 80% of purely online students and 40% of on-campus students in the US work full-time. Full-time. It means that they have an eight-hour workload on a day and they still go to university after. I got some data, it's not on the screen, but I got some data here that um, there was a report published by Euro students and the network of researchers in Europe, and they were saying, obviously, some countries in Europe, like Norway or Finland, only about 10% of the students work because the government supports them. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have, um, I know there's some people from Portugal here, Portugal and Greece, over 70% of students work full-time. This is crazy. Or work in some capacity, not full-time, some, in some capacity. That's yeah, that's what it said. Well, it's from the report. I'll give you the, the reference later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so as you can imagine, there's a really unbalanced way here where we were, the, it, some universities, some university courses are still really geared from a student being just full-time dedicated to studies, which is not um, the same. So I wanted to share a little bit of my insights, what makes for good learning, but I want you to, I want you to shout out a few things at me as well, because I don't want to be here just talking about my practice. I want to be learning from you. I have people from all over Europe here. I'm very excited to be listening from you too. So I put in a few things here. Um, the first one is related to a student at the center of what we do. So it goes back to the quote of Sir Ken Robinson, right? Anybody want to shout something else? What makes for good learning? Engagement, yes, absolutely. Tell me more about engagement. <laughs> Perfect, that's exactly it. If every time you actually give the students such a strong um, parameters and they're very tight, the students lose, lose interest. They want to be interested. So this is great, thank you. That's a very good point. Somebody else said something down here and I didn't quite catch it before. Challenge, absolutely, that's it. Because they want to feel that they have been challenged. They don't want to feel like they're just absorbing content. <laughs> yes, that's it. Think on their own. Absolutely, this is such a good point. I see a lot of courses and a lot of academics, they feel like that they have to spoon feed the students with everything. We want to empower the students to make their own decisions. We want to empower the students to have ownership of their learning experience. That's brilliant, that's great. Anything else? Motivation, Motivation. yes, that's fabulous. I love that because, um, again, if you are dealing with students who are split between so many things that they are doing between study, working, caring for someone or whatever, how we keep them motivated, how do we keep them engaged, right? So there's a few things here in the slide. I think the ones that I would like probably to highlight is are, are um, opportunities for the students to practice what they learn. Again, if you really think about the lecture format, they don't really have a time to engage with the content. They're literally sitting there like a vessel and we are pouring the content in their heads. It's not always work because somebody comes here and come out of here, right? <laughs> so let's make sure that we br bring some opportunities for them to practice what they learn. Um, the other thing that I, that I like to highlight from here, which very little people actually talk about, is um, feedback. How can we improve the feedback that we give to the students? I know when you're dealing with large number of, of students, it's really hard to give individual feedback. Sometimes you just give that generic thing. But for the individual student, um, it's th what makes a difference in their learning. Because you could argue with me, oh, well, if I want to learn something, I can literally go to YouTube, find a video, 
There will be a demonstration. I will do it myself. And I say, okay, well, I've learned something. Did I? There's nobody there to tell me, oh, Janet, you're doing well. Or Janet, actually, you did, you know, something right. And, um, but this bit is not quite right yet. You need to practice a little bit more. This is where we come in. We can help the students, support them. And again, that will give them the motivation, right? That will give them the engagement. Because if we're telling them, you're so close. Have you looked at about this extra thing that you need to look into? Or, you know, um, try doing these other exercises. We'll, we'll hook them in. And then we'll help the students uh, see how they are tracking. And empowering the students in terms of they have their ownership of their learning experience. All they need is you guiding them, not telling them what to do word by word, right? The other thing that I like to share, and I know a few people uh, feel a bit cringe when I show this slide. First of all, because it's McKinsey Company, so a few people don't take that very seriously. It's not an education university of research. Obviously, they do employ lots of researchers to do this work for them. But when I was teaching purely online, there are some things that purely online institutions do that now more than ever could help us keep the students engaged and give them a better learning experience. And a few things, again, so apologies for the graph, is a little bit blurry there, but I will try to read out. So, um, things that I find that help the students are um, seamless journey. When the students get started in your course, make sure that uh, we can give them that uh, clarity of where they start, how it progresses, and where they will end. So I see here in the audience a few of the, my lovely academics that I have been working for in the University of Woods, sorry, in the Polytechnic. And um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking when we are redesigning courses is about set the expectations right. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on the, all of you in a minute because I'm gonna ask how your students are going, okay? <laughs> um, the other thing, it is uh, engaging teaching approach. So people have this misconception that online can be absolutely passive and they, the teacher then becomes invisible. And, and, and that's the worst thing you could ever do. So I think this combination of um, bringing the students uh, in, but also bringing the academic into the online space and the digital space, it's important. And there are ways we can do that by um, creating different learning formats, creating opportunities to be synchronous at the same time connected to your students, um, creating captivating experiences. So talking about the engagement, about the motivation, what do the students like doing today online? Can anybody tell me what, what the students spend most time online doing these days? Playing. Say it again. Social media, yes. So how social media works? Tell me a little bit more about social media because I'm interested on. Pardon? Yes, it goes viral. But you think about the, think about the content of social media. It is short, it's snappy. So how can we make some of our learning like that? Sound bites sometime. It could be a sound bite, it could be a little video. It does not to be high production, does not need to be high production. This is one of the things that I've learned from my experience at UQ, is the student would appreciate a video same way if it was an academic with a phone walking by the campus talking at them, or if it was a setup in the studio, high production. As long as the quality of the content is good, they didn't mind. So there's all of these little things that are part of their day-to-day -day and go back to the motivation, engagement, and the things that they are used to seeing, right? Um, the last one here is the ca a caring network. And I think this was something that absolutely got highlighted through COVID, because as you can imagine, a lot of the students lost interest, they felt isolated, they feel disconnected from the university, they felt disconnected from the academics, they felt disconnected from their peers. So we need to help them build that network that supports them. It's not only us. It needs to be some of the student services and the student uh, support within the university, and you probably know the people who you can, you know, Go and check it out. What type of services do, do we offer? I was surprised 
but both universities that I work with, how many academics don't even know that there is a whole team sometimes that is there to help students just with academic skills. Will help the students just on writing essays, for example, or how to research. They didn't know. They felt that they need to fill that gap. But we don't have, we are not on this alone. You know, we can find that support and we can help the students find the support as well. Because most of the time the students also don't know. Because the content with, with their contact time is with us and we, if we don't know, we don't tell them. <laughs> so ultimately, what will make us re-engage the students is not only technology, but it's us, how we help them and how we help ourselves help them. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so I'll stop talking now. So I wanted to hear from you, all of you, what digital learning strategies have you used to support your students? Anyone? Eva, I'm gonna pick on you. A lot, a lot, yes, absolutely. You could use a lot, right? Anybody, somebody else here said something else? No, we got shy. I think the point what I'm trying to make here is, going back to the previous slide, people and technology, is don't use technology just for the sake of technology. Make it meaningful, you know? Make it by design something that you want the students to interact with. Um, and it can be anything, really, it can be anything. As long as you make it interesting for the student and you make it bring that to uh, what adds to the student experience, the learning experiences, you have some really good choices there. And whatever you feel comfortable, don't force yourself for doing something just because the next person is doing it. My friend who likes Ken Robinson. Yes, a hundred percent. Brilliant. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Okay, so my next question is, what have you tried and it didn't work? We ha rarely share our failures, right? But it's important because we learn from them. Anyone? Willing to share something that they try doing and it worked and failed miserably? Yes. We try doing some um, videos because when we do the practical teaching mm -hmm. uh, during the COVID, they didn't have the chance to spend so much time in the lab, so we just tried to do some videos to teach them the important concepts before they came to uh, the practical lesson and then we could focus on the practice yeah. during that time. But I think maybe 20% of the students just watch the videos before coming to the class. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we found out later that when you put content that is longer than maybe five, ten minutes, they disconnect automatically. So Good learning. This is a great learning. This is exactly it. Because as I said to you, I was not a learning designer. When I started doing this work, I was exactly doing what you do. I was trialing and narrowing things. I picked things and said, oh, I think this is going to work. And realistically, sometimes it didn't work, but I've learned through that, right? And this is, I invite you all to try something different. And it's fine, because we are all through this, going through this journey together. And the students are true. They will appreciate the effort that we are making, and they will give you some feedback about that. But you, the point you make about the video, the duration of the video is so important, right? Um, I was reading somewhere about the, the attention span of people these days have dropped from what used to be 12 seconds to something, to seven. 
which means that if you don't grab their attention in the first seven seconds or something, they moved on. And this is not related to the students, this is all of us, <laughs> okay? So here you got it, a little hook on how, how you hook your students. Um, first seven seconds. Um, cool. Last question I have for you. This is a big one. <laughs> I know all of us have maybe slightly different challenges. Anybody want to share something? What are your main challenges? needs a total change of a, of a learning habit, okay? flipping the classroom. So um, just, I think you have to work for months with the students, really, to, to make them uh, into that routine that there is always something to read before class, in class we discuss, and there is always something to do after class. Okay? Yep. And I think that's the biggest challenge, yep. really. How many people here have similar challenge to that? <laughs> Lots of hands, yes. Yes, absolutely on point. I think the difficulty, we are living in this really interesting time in between the transition from old style teaching, where it was mostly passive, to this new contemporary style of teaching, where we want the students to be more engaged. The students want to engage, but they are not used to it, right? And if you really think from the student's point of view, so much easier if I don't have to do anything before or after the classroom. Realistically, what they are not ready yet is to understand that um, they are not learning very much. Don't, please, don't take this as a criticism. I'm trying to word this in a better way. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, think about the time that we went to university, where we sat in the classroom, in lectures, set an exam, move on to the next course. What do you remember from that? <laughs> Not very much, right? Yes. Well, actually, uh, I remember that very well. And Good. I remember loving it. I remember, I remember loving being in the lecture hall like this. Yeah. I remember loving being with my colleagues. I, re I remember loving the coffee break. And I remember loving the smell of the library and the, and the, and the books yes. and the paper. So it wasn't all bad. And no. We did a lot of learning. Yeah. Which means the atmosphere and context matters. Right? That's the experience. That's about the learning experience that we are living in. This is the things that stay with us, what we are experiencing. No, yeah, right? I do love the, the smell books as well. I am an old school, I am a technology evangelist, but I am an old school person at heart, so bear with me. Yes. changes, you know, that can be very much observed, but also maintain the good traditional ways of doing things at the university. Okay. Um can can I be a bit controversial and ask what do you mean by good traditional ways of teaching? Well, I, I would say the community, maintaining the community and keeping um, academia as a place of exchanging arguments, opinions. You know, debating about absolutely, absolutely, I, I mean. absolutely, absolutely. There's some fundamental practices that we don't want to lose, right? I think this is a very good point. And I'm sorry that I, I ask you to elaborate because I still hear academics, and forgive me if you were one of those who said, I like teaching in a lecture where I just talk to the students. I'm hating what I'm doing right now. Can I just say that this hurts me? <laughs> Somebody here said something different. Sharing, yes, yes, absolutely. Because again, go back to the experience. It's what we are living, and what we are living within our student community, with our academics, but the same thing for the academics. It's exactly the same. If you just literally rock, in, rock up to the university one day, I deliver my class and walk out, I am missing out the opportunity to connect with the brain trust here. Look at these amazing people sitting in this room. I want to learn from you. I want to connect with you. I want to hear what is working for you that I can bring to my practice. And I want to share with you, oh, you know what? I was talking about my failure. Like When I was doing purely online learning, I decided that I wanted to give my students audio feedback. Right? 
I thought this is going to be grand because then I don't have to type. It was much faster to record audio. And I was trying to get my team to use audio feedback. First of all, first thing that I've noticed when I recorded myself giving someone feedback is I do have a Polish accent when I speak English. A lot of people tell me that. A lot of people think that I am Polish. I'm not Polish. Um, the second thing was um, my other academics didn't want to engage with audio feedback. It was weird. It's confronting to hear your own voice. <laughs> So it, it's, it was a bit of a failure too, you know what I mean? Like, anyway, so, so yeah, so it, it's this exchange, sharing my experience and you sharing your experience and we learn from each other. So this is absolutely uh, the point of all of this. Okay, so how are we tracking for time? Is that the five minutes left? Five minutes left. Okay, so I'm going to move to something a little bit, I'm going to skip this one for a second. No, 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 this one is good. Because I think the whole point of this project that you set it up, Dorota, oh, well, you and your partner, sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't want to steal the credit of everybody else who worked really hard at it, was to really think about what is the future of education, what happens now. COVID has passed, but it means like we know for a fact that we can be disrupted at any single time, and we are being disrupted every single day. <laughs> so, I wanted to crowdsource some interesting topics. What else? have been in your mind lately, that you are still dealing with the, let's say, the crisis of pandemic, but you're already thinking about, oh, this is the next wave of things that I probably need to be on top of. Chat GPT, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, do you have met metaverse classes? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was interested to hear if anybody here was already working with the metaverse. I know some universities are already launching courses. How is that working? Um, we, we bought eight classes and we made this workshop yep. two, years, uh, two weeks before with the, with the um, project. Yep. And I think that's a really new step. This we are teaching and this to have six to three videos, there will be presentations. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the, the opportunities, and the, the, it's endless, right? What you can do because you have no barriers. It's fascinating. I'm very fascinated about the metaverse. Yeah, actually, most of the parents and students, uh, it is not high. It's accepted too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned ChatGPT as well. So, what are you finding um, challenging with ChatGPT? Yeah. Yeah. So when you provide recent content, content uh, you have a chance that the students create new content mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. their own. Yeah. But if you just give them uh, ready, well-known topics, uh, you risk that they cheat. I want to take this opportunity that I have so many people in academia here in a room, and I'm going to ask a question. Are you pro or con chat GPT usage in teaching? Pro. 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 Does anyone here doesn't haven't heard of ChatGPT? That I, I have to give you a bit of an insight. Haven't heard of ChatGPT? Yes. Oh, you're con. Con. Okay, con. Who who is against the use of ChatGPT? Okay. There's a lot of people in the maybe, I guess. <laughs> You're four, yeah. So funnily enough, in Australia, the big, uh, the top eight universities in Australia decided to go back to pen and paper exams because of ChatGPT. I was appalled by that because it's like when the calculator came out and people saying, let's not let our students use a the calculator, they will have to use those tools in the future in their jobs. We need to prepare them, not take them away. Exactly, absolutely. Um, I am lucky enough to leave with someone, which happens to be my husband, that works for Microsoft. And Microsoft has made a partnership with OpenAI to bring ChatGPT, well, OpenAI, not ChatGPT specifically, to all their products. So in a not so distant future, you will have that at your Word document, or your Excel document. We need to help the students use those tools, because it's going to be a tool, just another tool, like all the other ones, right? Correct. 100% right, 100% right. Okay, anything else that anybody would like to raise that is I, we haven't talked about yet? Top of your mind or 
future top of your mind that you think, oh, this is going to be interesting when it hits a, a, a academia universities? Being humble as academics, we are not the only source of info right now. It's quite scary, isn't it? It's quite scary. Yeah? I have a question. How could we introduce chat to the uh, lecture? How could we use it? Yeah, look, I have seen some really interesting case studies. I have been following that quite, quite closely, actually. So a lot of academics and a lot of uh, researchers and learning designers have been using prompts to ask uh, ChatGPT to act on, as take a persona and act as something. So not only um, write me, ask a question, can you write me about, you know, World War II, let's say, um, which is pretty simple. But if you can create prompts, you can actually get the much more um, interesting responses. So, so for example, uh, if you are teaching a communication or writing class, let's pick something very simple, but you can say uh, acting, you can ask, uh, add as a prompt, acting as a professional copywriter, could you edit this text? So you put your text in and the chat GPT either rewrite or make suggestions on how you can, I wanted this to be more concise, exactly. I want, to, I want this to be a little bit more technical, add references, for example. So you write the text, that's different ways you can do it. But you can ask them to chat GPT to interview you. So say acting as an expert in a certain field, ask me questions about something. And you have to provide the answers, not chat GPT, but they have to ask the questions to you. Um, I have seen people use to simple things. If I want to create a very complex formula in Excel, can you please show me how to do it? You know what I mean? Like is, even to be um, a guide on the side for activities, you could use uh, in, um, help your students use that as someone who can be there with them when they are performing an activity. Um, yeah, there's quite very different interesting ways. I will be happy to find some uh, references to share with you if you like. Because I have a few actually, I just don't have it handed on my presentation, but I'm happy to share. All right, so, Dorota is looking at me and saying like, Janet, stop talking. <laughs> um, well, it's gonna be a full on day. I hope this chat was uh, a little bit insightful of what the people are doing. Uh, I hope that I can get to talk to some of you during the day because I would love to hear more from you. And um, if you would like to connect with me, please, by all means, um, this, is my, this is my email from Wood University, so you can connect with me here or add me on LinkedIn because I would love to keep in touch with a lot of people. So thank you so much for your time, for your participation, and um, I'll see you around. Yeah, for us, how to, yeah. The very first question I usually ask my students, what is the difference between study at the university and uh, being taught in school, at school? I, I don't recognize any difference because when you enter this building, almost every time, you can see very passive students listening to the very boring lectures. Yeah, that's true. So we are, well, thanks to Janet and any, we can make some changes and we do hope in the future we will be able to make it more active, not really passive. Okay, it seems that we didn't design the program in a perfect way, as far as I see. <laughs> We planned a session for three hours in the morning, and we are not pretending to be a killer, conference killers or audience killers. So let's make a deal. Right now, I will maybe introduce you to the project because this is a part of the final conference. So I'd like to share with you some intellectual outputs and findings from our project. And then we will make a short break, okay? Okay, short for 10, 15 minutes, not longer. Okay, would it be okay for you guys? Yeah, good, good, good. So where is my assistant? Aga? Where is my assistant? Where is my Aga also has an assistant. Ah, okay, that's, thank you. Yes, 
know, technical issues as always. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Huh? But please come back. <laughs> okay, I promise not to be really, you know, just showing the DP in the pen. Where is the pen? Do you see me? I am slipper. Where is the back? We should read it. Sorry. That's weird. Oh no. Okay. Tak, tak, tak. Okay, thank you. Okay, so welcome back. Yeah, that's also a challenge. Non-stop talkers. <laughs> no, don't worry. Okay. So right now I'd like to share with you some, you know, main points, main objectives of our uh, ECLUS project. As you can see, uh, the project was um, done uh, under the very specific call. It wasn't, of course, Erasmus Plus project, but as you can see, the call was um, uh, run as fire. Uh, usually, the all calls are run in in the springtime, like in March. But this time, because of COVID, it was in the uh, in October, Ada, October, November, something like that, right? It was very specific one, very unique one. And it was uh, key action number two, as always, for higher education uh, partnerships. However, it was cooperation for innovation and exchange of good practices. So partnerships for digital education readiness. So our idea was, as I mentioned at the very beginning of, of our project, to elaborate some good tools and good uh, practices for our teachers, students to make this learning process and teaching process uh, more, more active, more motivating, more engaging for, uh, for our um, academic society. So the, the official title of the project is uh, quite challenging. A model for interactive, synchronous, asynchronous learning in online STEM education, STEAM education. But we use eClothes. We don't use this long one, right? Yeah, it's much easier for us. Uh, okay, um, it was founded by our Polish uh, agency, so for Foundation for the Development of the ed Educational System. So Polish uh, agency for Erasmus Plus program. We started two years ago. It was a pandemic time, so it was kickoff was uh, fully online. It was a two-day event, and it was quite weird for all of us. But we started somehow. We have four fantastic and highly committed partners, like the first one, University of Aveiro, University of Applied Sciences in Zagreb, and University of Alcala, and us, Los University of, of Technology. Um, we met for the first time, when we met for the first time, we decided to share as much as possible, because it was, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, it was quite strange time for all of us, for teachers, for administrators, for university authorities. I will ask Andy later on about first impression during COVID time. How um, did he manage to, you know, make some good decisions for for University of Applied Sciences in Zarbrücken? So, uh, but the, the the most important priority we wanted f to follow was to introduce to implement at the university level some innovative practices in this digital area. So, the priority of European Commission, but. Uh, the main, I would say, ambition on our side, at least our university side, was to, to develop some um, 
not only skills, but also to, to design a scheme for rewarding excellence in, in, in teaching. Because right now what we see at the university level in many uh, universities in Europe, um, the focus is put on the, on the research, on the papers, on the publishing. And uh, we would like our teachers to, to be also recognized, to recognize uh, this excellence in different uh, practices. So this is one point we wanted to match. And the second one, uh, of course, we, we would like to tackle some skills gaps and mismatches, uh, what was also mentioned by, by Janet, and uh, how to uh, how to make this process more adaptable? How to make it how to make it closer to our uh, learners' needs? Uh, so that is why we wanted to, to 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 make this project really useful, not simple Erasmus Plus project, but to take as much as possible to uh, to transform to promote. Uh, STEAM-oriented study programs to encourage and recognize civic knowledge, to also um, support the, some development of teaching competences uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I, I, this is not visible, sorry for that. I just uh, mentioned very briefly that, uh, of course, there were many problems because uh, well, during, uh, during the first period of the COVID time, uh, many challenges uh, appeared. First of all, technical, organizational, some IT capacity uh, deficiencies, uh, some problems in involving students in online learning, lack of methods and tools for, uh, to, to effectively assess learning outcomes, gaps in knowledge and skills of academic teachers, and of course, lack of availability uh, of some equipment, software, hardware, and so on and so on. So, first of all, we wanted to, as you know, hard results, uh, products of our project, we wanted to elaborate some solutions, methods, and tools which increase interaction between teacher and student. That was the very first ambition for us. Then, uh, we also wanted to support our teachers to, with some inspirational uh, training materials and tools, of course. Uh, and the very unique point of this project was to combine the psychology, pedagogy and, and technology, uh, how to, to discover those different perspectives of our, our academic staff and, um, and our uh, students. So, uh, and the big issue and also big challenge, uh, and even today I, I, I can tell you that it is still a challenge, uh, how to provide um, reliable assessment of online learning. This is really an uh, important issue to make this process, learning process, really reliable. We need some good tools and good solutions, not only for uh, courses, not only for delivery, but also for uh, assessment. Of course, we wanted many groups um, to be, well, somehow engaged in, in, in our project. Um, academic teachers, students, uh, partner university authorities, just to provide some specific recommendations, some solutions on how to develop and how to improve distance learning at this administrative, organizational, operational and strategic uh, level at the university. So we got some results, it's not very maybe visible, so I will go through. Let's move to our intellectual outputs. The first I.O., so first in, in intellectual outputs was about, um, well, survey or research conducted uh, at our universities and we wanted to know, we wanted to learn what is the 
difference between conventional, traditional distance learning and uh, what came, um, uh, well, and, and what happened uh, when the uh, COVID um, situation appeared at our university. So that was our uh, first goal. Uh, and for, we started with a study of some methods that were used in different partners universities. And uh, the unique um, issue related to our project was that we decided to, to divide this learning, teaching and learning process into four stages. Uh, preparation of classes, then uh, delivery, so conducting classes based on distance learning methods and techniques. Uh, verification of learning outcomes achieved through distance learning. And then the final evaluation of the quality uh, of different learning techniques. So in our report, on our web page, you will find some, you know, uh, findings from this research uh, showing that different stages uh, were related to different um, challenges. And of course, we also um, uh, did such a research in our universities uh, um, with different groups, not only in students, but also teachers, also administrative staff, so it can be also found. And of course, we also wanted to discover uh, some, well, practices, good practices that were used by other uh, universities, not very, not involved in our project, and to discover and identify the most modern and innovative activities in this area. So that was the very first step of our project. Then uh, we decided to make it more professional, more practical, uh, and um, University of Alcala decided to, to lead this part, and I'm really glad and very grateful because they are very much experienced in this field. And the most important uh, outcome of this part of the project was to develop um, a database uh, with different tools, uh, with different, uh, um, well, learning strategies that could be useful and helpful in online learning. So, um, so we prepared a kind of teacher guide with different uh, with different tools. Uh, we also, as I said, prepared a toolbox, database, uh, and very useful, divided into different learning uh, stages uh, for different needs, for different uh, types of learners, different characteristics uh, of uh, uh, teaching, um, attitudes, and so on and so on. So you will see it is really useful and very practically oriented. And we also uh, prepared something what we call survival kit. So sometimes you are not, you, you cannot use, you know, digital tools. Uh, so uh, we decided to design uh, some rescue kit cont containing some, some ideas, tricks to, to increase, um, to increase this interaction between, between students and uh, teachers. So this is also a part of our project, very practical one. Then, of course, we wanted our teachers to learn a little bit more and to, to participate in this co-creation process, in this, uh, um, to participate in this um, peer learning activity. So that is why we provided some uh, training courses um, uh, not only on uh, you know, how to use Teams and Zoom, it is important, it was very important part because as far as I learned, for example, I used uh, only very small percentage of Teams uh, functionality. Uh, so right now I'm much more professional uh, user of Teams. Uh, but uh, as I said, not only Teams, not only 
uh, Zoom can be useful for online training. We also wanted our teachers to, to learn a little bit more about visual uh, thinking in presenting. Um, because as you can see here, like one Im image can, you know, replace many words. So that is why we wanted our teachers to learn about this visual thinking and how to make presentations, how to flip them uh, into this active um, sketching or some how to make it more active using this virtual flip chart. Uh, so this is also something we would like to uh, share with uh, our teachers uh, and today you will have also an opportunity to use this flip chart during the workshop uh, with Alcala University, right? Am I right guys? Yeah? Okay, and of course, uh, trainings for teachers, maybe it's not. Um, and then we moved to uh, IO number four, the smart gamification. But this one, and, and I remember, I still remember our discussion we, we had before the submission of our uh, project. And then we met Frank, and we met the Portuguese and, and Spanish team, and they said, okay, gamification, this is of course the hot, hot topic, however, we should combine it with something else. And the idea was to combine it with uh, multiply intelligence theory. So this is, as you can see, uh, we, can, we can have different intelligences, different attitudes, different, uh, like learning personalities uh, and we well, we managed to, to combine uh, so you can see here music smart picture smart word smart number smart body smart people smart self smart nature smart life smart so smart students <laughs> uh, and it was the part led by our German colleagues um, University of Applied Sciences in, in Saarbrücken. Uh, and of course, again, we elaborated um, many teacher's guides and many tools uh, that we do hope make this uh, learning and teaching process more attractive and more motivating. Some gamification model and so on. And the very last uh, part of our uh, project was uh, um, devoted to online budgets because we learned at that time we already knew that it, uh, well, at that time it was a very specific moment in European uh, Commission because they have just started to, to work on upskilling, reskilling issues, how to make this process, how to make the profile of our graduates more diversified like how because they look more or less the same when they graduate because they graduate from the same program they they got the same learning key learning outcomes program learning outcomes key competences so at that time european commission wanted uh, to to change it a little bit to make um higher education not only more flexible but also to make the profile competence profile of our graduates more uh, more diverse so that is why we decided to implement online budgets for sustainable education so again we combined two issues the first one was micro credentials and online budgets and the second one sustainable um, development goals the very new topic to our students and we wanted them to learn but at the same time to, to have fun uh, in you know achieving uh, earning some some budgets and of course we elaborated some budgets uh, and it was very uh, really um, motivating and engaging uh, for students we also provided some trainings for our academic staff just to make it more uh, well um, clear for everyone and of course uh, at the very final stage of our project we we uh, prepared some guidelines and recommendations uh, so 
uh, just to summarize and uh, disseminate all results of the projects. Um, we also prepared some, we do hope, useful recommendation how to make this process, teaching and learning process, online process, more engaging, more motivating for students. And this part is led by University of Aveiro, our leader, Niall, is with us, and Natalia, and Paolo as well. So, very happy to, to have you here, because I would say this is the most challenging part. What to, you know, take off uh, or out of, of this uh, project. Okay, let me share with you some, you know, very briefly, some pictures, just to show you that it is important not only learn and not only to learn from this typical learning process, but the most important part, um, well, to get this motivation uh, was to have fun. I, and, and let's share with you very briefly, like, you know, happy faces, learning many things, like they really they are aware of sustainable development goals, they are aware of digital budgets, micro-credentials, they learned a lot about gamification. So it was really, you know, fruitful, but at the same time they were, they had fun, they really had fun all the time. As you can see, it was gamification again, yeah making friends, international, you know, this intercultural co cooperation, communication, that's also an important issue. And let me share with you some pictures from our Missouri camp, because we decided to take them to Missouri Lake uh, region, and not only for sailing, but also for digital budget activities. So it was in July last year, uh, the beginning of July. It was in Rogante. This is a very nice place, uh, like not very far from Gizetsko, so the capital of, of Mazure region. Very nice place, but very wild, I would say. And the main objective was of course, to develop some knowledge of badges, to develop some competences um, on how to apply for badges, online uh, digital badges, and of course, um, to learn a little bit more about SDGs and their role in the development of a future society, global society. And each participant had to earn at least three badges from the smart category and minimum two badges from the basic category. Uh, we had some watches like kitchen watch, camp watch, uh, also music watch like uh, singing uh, shanties. So it was really fun. Uh, we had 15 categories of different badges. So students participated in many activities in the morning, in the afternoon, um, like applying for a different, uh, different levels of badges. And again, it was, you know, a great fun. We had a great fun. They, uh, they stayed uh, intense, so it was also a unique uh, experience for many students, like sailing all the time discovering different sailing activities, like about safety, uh, yeah, about the different bonfire, very important element of, of uh, sailors' life. You can see they had really fun building some, you know, participating with teachers. It was also the co-creation process. So all of them participated, not only students were involved, but of course teachers were very much involved in everyday life, like starting from kitchen watch, like camp watch, uh, doing uh, gymnastics at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, day by day. So it was really, really nice and very unique. Yeah, and singing shanties together and cooking together. It was my kitchen watch. <laughs> Not easy task. And our Spanish team, like 
and the very, you know, very nice nature and very nice environment. Dancing, it was like uh, Belgian dance, I don't know, I don't know the, the English name, but like, yeah, dancing all together. Yeah, building a snail. This is our, like, very nice, you know, being together. And now you can see our um, teachers from Portugal. It was Antonio Neves and uh, his wife preparing the, the cake. It was an, yeah, it was our first birthday cake for Eclos project. It was also very nice. Yeah, very nice. So we had fun, and this is, you know, nature, uh, nature smart activities together with Paulina, our nature leader. It was five o'clock in the morning, five a.m. It was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very nice, very nice. And learning sailing as well, uh, some, you know, uh, theory about winds, about uh, about boats, about you know many important, yes, having some. Okay, and uh, yes, and a very nice song, La Vida Pirata, La Vida Mejor. So it was something we learned together and it was really fun uh, because we, we, it was a song we performed um, on the lake. Like it was like seven boats on the lake, and we all together uh, performed this song. It was really nice and really engaging for all of us. Like so, very nice, very integrating. Our teachers singing uh, shanties as well, and also participating in some sailing activities. So uh, that's it. And now I'd like you to to guess something. Let me show you. One more thing, at the very end of my presentation, this is here. Okay, we also had a challenge. Do you recognize this car? No. Okay, so what do you think? How many people were inside the car? How many were in the car? Who will guess? Just guess. 25. 25. Who said 25? Okay. 18. 18. Yeah, that's a Guinness record. Like the. Okay. Okay. Let me show you the movie. Is it on the. Nie, no Agnieszka miała film. Gdzie jest Agana? No ja nie A dźwięk jest? Aga, nie ma dźwięku? Był? Dźwięk z tego, co ja Okay, uh, I will show you because the, the challenge was to move the car, not only...
Okay. And now. <laughs> Here, one more, one more. Congratulations, that was that was twenty four. But that was the challenge, believe me, it was like... <laughs> uh, so we had fun and it was three great, uh, a great moment of my life and uh, I do hope it was also the same for our students and academic staff participating, but you know, it's like showing that, that you can learn, you know, in every single moment of your life. Like, learn from different people, from different cultures, from different activities. And that's, uh, I, I would say, the most important memory and most important issue I will, you know, take with me for the for rest of my life. So thank you very much. Let's have a break right now and then we will start the panel. Okay, thank you. 15 minutes, let's be back in, what time is it? 10 past 11, please be back, back 10 past 11.
What else it is?
A. Potrzebuje pani też jeszcze jedno krzesło, potrzebuje tu na środku. Bo... Ale tak jest, takie samo? Tak, tu na środku. Już, już. Raz, raz, dwa. Okay. OK, welcome back. Good to see you again. And now, as promised, we would like to share with you some results of our IO number one. Do you remember what IO number one is about? <laughs> yes, it's about research we conducted in different universities. Uh, research uh, on different perspectives uh, for teachers, for students, for administrative staff, for university authorities. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our great panelists coming from different um, universities, partner universities. So I will start with Professor Andy Juncker, the Vice President of um, University of Applied Sciences in Saarbrücken, Germany. Welcome. <laughs> Professor Frank Ruckert from the same university, Germany. Uh, Rosa Estliege Hanna. I, you, I need to learn it. Welcome from Alcala University. Soraya Garcia Esteban uh, from the University of Alcala as well. Welcome. <laughs> Natalia Martins from Aveiro University. <laughs> and Paulo Gahim from Aveiro University as well. <laughs> Last but not least, Ada Kozłowska from the Lodz University of Technology. Okay, so yeah, let's start with a short introduction. Could you please introduce yourself shortly, tell what you do at the university, what is your position, and what's, what was your role in this project? Okay, very shortly, Micros, yeah, thank you. And I will move down. Okay, does it work? Yeah. Yeah, yes, please. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, so once again, Ada Kozlowska, I'm from Lodz University of Technology, and here I chair the Center for Teaching and Learning. So um, as Dorota has already mentioned, uh, well, we, we came up with the idea for the project. Uh, we've been discussing at this, you know, top managerial level, um, the difficult situations we were all put in and uh, after the first few months of this great shock that came to us uh, and uh, in fact it was during the summer vacation where we had a, a lot of time for reflection and a lot of time for, for the questioners, talks with people that the whole idea was born and um, yeah and we were trying to implement the best practices in our university but we definitely needed a benchmark you know with our colleagues uh, abroad just to see what's going on thank you and please tell us what do you do at our university what's your role oh uh, yeah so um i'm the director for the center of teaching and learning so in fact uh, um together with the uh, directors um we care for um, the educational offer of our university. I'm also responsible for all the teacher support and teacher training. Um, and just trying, you know, to keep up with the latest trends in education, uh, mm -hmm. trying to make our university, you know, move up in the uh, rankings and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ada. Let us now move to Professor Frank Rukert. Uh, Dorota, thank you very much and a very warm welcome from my side. I'm Professor Frank Rückert from University of Saarland, HDW Saar, and I'm teaching in the field of engineering science, also basic science like physics or mathematics. And um, yeah, I came to this project to thank of Dorota and her team. And I think it was a really interesting time. It was the starting of the Corona pandemic. A lot changed. We changed a lot of teaching. 
and I'm always really interested in new teaching methods. Um, we had a good chance, we got a great funding, we got great uh, uh, support uh, by University of Butch and Nava, of course, and um, we had a good chance to uh, make experiments with new methods. Yeah? We tried to go into the virtual workspace to teach students from all Europe with um, new tools, new teaching methods, new methods in gamification. And I think, well, it was a good time. So before I give the mic to um, Andy Juncker, I also want to mention thank you to you and your team for inviting us. It's thank a pleasure. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Rucker. And now... Yeah, my name is Andy Juncker, uh, so I'm a professor for uh, corporate finance and financial analysis in my normal life. <laughs> but since 2017, I'm the elected uh, vice president for academic and international affairs of HGW, as mentioned before. And uh, yeah, 2020 was the situation where you don't want to be vice president for academic affairs, because you get millions of questions where you don't really have an answer. So is this allowed? Can I do that? What can we do? Is it allowed to, to use online tools for my teaching load? Because we have all these regulations, which is, we, we never talked about online teaching according to our teaching load duties. So that was officially not allowed. And in that period of time, um, I think we developed the sentence, done is better than perfect. So we allowed a lot of new things. The good thing was um, uh, our, our um, schedule, our um, lecture period is a little bit different from the international scheme. So our lectures are from mid-October till mid of February and then from mid of April till end of July. So in that situation, the pandemic situation came in a, in a good period. So it came mid of March, so we had time enough to think about how to start the lectures <laughs> in the beginning of April. And I, yeah, I, I would say we, we did a really great job. And yeah, of course, yeah. things like that just gave some new food for thought. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Juncker. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Rosa Estrega. I am a professor at the University in Alcala uh, in the Computer Engineering Department. I have been teaching for more than 20 years. And I have always tried to combine um, my professional teaching with my uh, research interest and also with the love that I feel for teaching and learning. Uh, I think that uh, being a teacher is one of the best uh, jobs in the world. Um, even my, well, I have um, 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 teaching and using uh, active learning for more than 10 years. Even I didn't know that it, it was called active learning and flipped classroom and that kind of thing. I just only tried to um, improve the result for my students, to enjoy, to engage, because I teach a subject in the engineering degrees. Uh, um, as you know, engineering degrees has a lot of students that fail. And I try to change and I try to, to motivate my students so I First, I started recording videos, short videos, for uh, five minutes, and it works. And I uh, take advantage of this time that my students study at home to, to devote, devote more time to my students. Um, I was um, um, involved in the eClose project from the beginning, and I'm very happy to to have participated in the, I think that almost in all eclose input outputs, I had been in, in the meeting of uh, Saarbrücken, also in Aveiro, and in the multiply event in, in Alcala, of course. And even I have um, been one of the teachers in the, in the training in Alcala. And now uh, I'm here, I'm very happy to be here. And Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Rosa. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for to Dorota and all the team who has um, organized or who have organized um, this project so efficiently, so professionally, and so human. 
So thank you very much for, for organizing and, and um, leading, leading this project. Um, I'm Soraya Garcia. I'm an associate professor at the University of Alcala. I belong to the modern philology department, but I've been teaching at the Faculty of Education for more than 12, 12 years, I would say now. Uh, I've been teaching um, didactics on how to teach English and um, other subjects uh, uh, to students from primary education to secondary education. And I am currently the, edu the coordinator of the uh, master's um, uh, in teacher education for secondary students. Um, actually, I would define my keywords, um, or the keywords that define my, my work or my interest are um, teacher training. I've been working on, on that. Uh, um, English for, for professional purposes or, or working on, for example, uh, business English or English for tourism or how to teach um, computer assisted instruction or educational technology. I've been working on my, my primary research is on the collaboration and, um, and uh, in the development of skills and competences um, with uh, virtual collaboration or with digital tools. So I think um, I've been putting into practice most of the uh, outputs of this project, or I've been trying to uh, give my views or, or um, uh, about it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I've been working in, in five um, international projects as well, apart from this one, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'm here thanks to, to Elisa, who is, um, is unable to be here because we participated in another European uh, Erasmus Plus project called Online Courses for Mobile Students. That's why we, uh, she put, it, um, put us in contact with you. So my other five projects are related to global competence with telecollaboration um, between um, two universities, Belgium um, and University in Antwerp, Belgium and Spain, and we carry out some um, telecollaboration to, to enhance comp uh, global competence development. Then we've been working with different five universities around the world uh, to develop uh, telecollaborative networks for the development of, of um, generic competences and virtual exchange for competence development. I've been on another project as well for uh, attention to diversity in bilingual education, which has also helped on how to focus on students' needs and interests. That, that was the idea. And another one about the impact of uh, oral test performance in the British um, test, in oral test for the British Council, which also gives some advice on the problem, the issues we have had during the online teaching with assessment and um, online assessment. So that also, this was previous, and I think I think that will be one of the conclusions I'm anticipating. One of the one of the issues. Um, and my contribution to here, I think I've been in all the outputs. I've been contributing in the shadow. I think. Uh, apart from budgets and gamification, which I, I couldn't, I've been um, doing the analysis of, um, of teachers and put it to practice the toolbox in all my subjects. Um, also, the, um, uh, I assisted with the teacher training, searching for professors and with the students as well for, the, for going to the, work, uh, to, to the wonderful uh, workshops you created um, abroad. So I was just making the interviews and, and so on. And I was assistant with the teacher, uh, with the teacher training as well, as already said. And, um, and I participated in the best practices that I, I think we will explain here. Um, we propose, I think you will explain the best practices in this project. We propose some, which were, for example, um, some publications, some presentations in, 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 um, in conferences about predictive models on online education, in flipped learning, yeah. I put it into account. Uh, and the Collaboratech project which uh, at the, our university which dealt about, we explained our university what we did in this project. So it was disseminated in our university. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank attention. you very much, Soraya. So Natalia. hello, first of all, I want to say that it's a great pleasure to be in Guch University of Technology. It's my first time in Guch. And I want to thank Dorota and the rest of the team to invite the university to be part of this interesting project. <laughs> My name is Natalia Martins, and I, I am associated professor at the Department of Mathematics. I teach more than 25 years also. <laughs> it's a long time. Usually I teach mathematics to the first year students of STEM courses. Uh, because in the University of Aveiro we are special in the sense that we don't have faculties, we only have departments, so we have to teach the mathematics to all the courses of the university. So. I met with many students from different uh, backgrounds. And in the CLOSE project, I'm the local coordinator 
in the University of Aveiro of the Eclos project, and I was more involved in the first intellectual output that was uh, making the two surveys to students and teachers in the analysis of the results, and also in the last intellectual output that is the we have to do a set of guidelines and recommendations for teachers, academic teachers, uh, students, and academic um, authorities. So thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Last but not least. <laughs> oh, good morning. My name is Paulo Cachin, and I'm also from the University of Aveiro. I'm a civil engineer in the areas of uh, structural engineering. I'm a professor for more than 30 years or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I actually love, uh, love teaching, I love uh, games, and I love uh, playing games with students and gamification. And I like to do so, those kind of uh, activities with the students when it is possible, sometimes it isn't. And uh, in, uh, in a sense, the COVID-19 was, was really a big challenge because Although universities want us to be very innovative, when you are too innovative, they don't like it too much. So <laughs> if you move, they want us uh, to be online, but actually if you want to give some classes online, it's very, it's, <laughs> it was forbidden because you have very strict regulations. So it's, sometimes it's not so easy to move from <laughs> new things. And regarding this project, I'm helping Natalia in the coordination of the project because actually in Navar we are a big, team in, the, in, this, in this project, so we are divided by the different IOs. I was responsible for the, in Aveiro for the IO4 about gamification and also worked in IO2 about in the, in the toolbox and of course in IO6, which is our responsibility. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Paolo. Well, as we all know, the COVID-19 uh, impact um, significantly on, the, on teaching and learning at our universities. And uh, I, I'd like to learn what was the very first reactions at your university immediately after the pandemic outbreak. So maybe Andy Juncker, Professor Andy Juncker could start as a you know, university authority. So what was your you know, first thought? What to do? What decision you made? Well, um, of course, we were a little bit shocked, yeah, and uh, the only idea was to, to provide lectures to the students so that they can end their study program within time. So what the good thing was, as I mentioned before, we had these two, three weeks, so, and we directly uh, provided a special budget to all the professors so that they could afford some uh, mobile uh, devices like, like tablets or visualizers or stuff like that. And uh, for heaven's sake, we already had introduced um, a, a student management system called Moodle. I think we all know that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that was well accepted. So uh, a lot of teachers already used that for just uploading the handout. And now they, of course, used it for video conferencing and stuff like that. And we changed the regulations for the students so that, for example, uh, we allowed them to take part in an exam. Okay. And if they failed, it did not count as a fail. Yeah. That's so nice. the idea was to, 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 to lower the threshold uh, because they, they thought we did not learn enough. Yeah, because it's online, it's a new situation. I don't know if I'm well prepared. So we said, hey, just go in the exam. If you pass, you're fine. And you can decide if you just would like to have the grade or just the word passed. And if you fail, we don't count it as a fail. So that helped a lot. To, to bring the students down. So these were the two main things, so the special budget and the change of the rules. But still we had to fight with our authority uh, because the regulations were very strict. So in, in our rule they say you have a teaching load of 18 hours okay. per semester and it has to be in presence. It was not allowed to, to, to count teaching online. So we changed that, yeah. But in the, in the very beginning, that was the biggest issue because all colleagues said, hey, so obviously I'm doing nothing here <laughs> because it's not relevant what I'm doing. And of course, they did way more than just walk mm -hmm. and chalk. I think we all know that. Yeah. So these colleagues which have their white 
chalk in their hand and just walk through the uh, group and, and write something on the blackboard. So the very old fashioned style. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of things changed. But you asked me regarding the two main things and I would like to point out the special budget and the change mm -hmm. of regulations. Okay, thank you very much. Natalia, how your university did convince you know, teachers to, to use some modern tools? Have you equipped them with some, I don't know, IT equipment or anything like uh, Andy Juncker did? That's indeed a very nice idea to buy some, some you know, equipment for... How did it look like uh, yes, in, in Aveiro? In Aveiro it was very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it was very complicated because uh, the second semester in Aveiro usually starts in February. So we have maybe two weeks and then the COVID pandemic. In the beginning, the, the rector says that we have two weeks to prepare two classes. But then it was not. You only have one week. And the majority of the teachers don't uh, didn't work with any video conference tool because in Aveiro, I think there is only one course that is uh, online. The other is classical classes on campus. So it was very stressful uh, time. The university uh, didn't uh, give us any sub financial support to buy anything. The teachers have to buy if they want. The support of the university was um, to work every, uh, during the first three or four months of the pandemic, we have several online workshops to teach the teachers how to work with Zoom, Teams, uh, Moodle, and innovative and active methods to engage students during online classes, but it was a very stressful time because we didn't have any experience doing online uh, teaching. We don't have any financial support to buy uh, <laughs> ICT tools, so it was really So how difficult. did you manage, you know, like without the money, without equipment, yes. without yes. skills? This, this, usually the, some uh, colleagues bought the um, iPads by their own, uh, screen tables, but some uh, teachers use uh, paper and uh, with the smartphone, and showing what they are, but it was not, not easy at all. Okay, thank you so much. Rosa, maybe you could share your experience from Alcala University. Okay, of course. Uh, well, um, even although um, <coughs> uh, technology and, and tools for virtual and, um, were, were um, uh, widely used uh, this last, last years, uh, in Spain, um, in the university in Alcalá, uh, the public university in Spain, um, presencial teaching is um, mandatory. Uh, so before the, the COVID, and um, when the after the the COVID, uh, the university provide um, teachers with resources. Um, I think that very very quickly um, the teacher who requests for uh, laptop, um, digital tablet, uh, headphones, uh, microphones, the, the university pr provide. Even some students that need um, laptop, uh, the university provide laptop and some <coughs> economical help for students that need it. And also um, we use in Alcala, we use uh, as a learning management system Blackboard and a lot of uh, new characteristics were, were well, uh, Blackboard was improved using or um, including, um, of course, video conference, but also um, um, video editors like Culture and also um, uh, Book Lab and other things to engage students. Um, even after not not exactly but well well when we uh, return to classes again um, um university invest uh, in streaming in order to to protect st uh, students and teachers keeping the distance so the the half of the students go at, at, at classes and the other 
the other half of the students attending at, attend at home. And I think that um, this was, it was of course very, very difficult, especially for teachers who were not used to video conference and to use uh, tablets. That's Thank hard moments. What I remember from that time, it was, you know, that high pressure I had in my mind, like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, how to convert all my classes, you know, especially, I, I also got some practical classes in the lab, like doing production engineering, and I was like, how to do it online? I mean, so, but Ada, maybe you could tell us, share with us, how did it look like from, from your perspective of a director of teaching and learning center at our university? Yeah, so um, as Andy already mentioned, there were first there were a lot of questions, like, am I allowed to do that? How can I do that? And so on and on. And uh, they were all, you know, uh, they, they all came to, to our center, right? Because we are a central unit for, for teachers. Um, and I remember that back then we pushed, let's say, or we took all our energy uh, and effort and we pushed that towards teacher training and student training as well. So uh, I remember the first two weeks uh, after the lockdown. Um, it was like, you know, uh, a kind of a massive uh, teacher training uh, organized here. So I remember that within the, those two weeks, we already had something like uh, 10 uh, great workshops, like a quick start to our Moodle, a quick start to Microsoft Teams, a quick start to um, webinars. Uh, we were lucky that our university had already the tools in place because uh, the model um, has been with us for um, for almost 10 years. Uh, Microsoft Teams was introduced just one year before the, the outbreak. Of course, these were not popular tools, okay? But at least we had a few teachers passionate about them, and we had already, you know, the um, the staff who could help us with training, with sharing good practices. Um, and my my colleagues here, I remember Gertruda, Monica, um, and, and some other teachers, uh, really working hand in hand with us and organizing those online webinars. All of them were recorded. Um, we also put a lot of effort into writing, you know, those uh, manuals, uh, recording instructional videos. We also produced something like uh, a survival kit, a kind of a little toolbox with, uh, with those tools we knew. So we kind of collected them from different teachers who knew Miro, Kahoot or, or others. Ah, just show us, you know, how it works. A short description, a link and off we go to others, okay? so. This is what we did, and, and I think that we passed this sort yeah, of exam, exam because later in the questionnaire, we had response both from teachers and students, and more than 90% were satisfied with the initial supports okay. that we gave. That's good, that's good. Okay, the main objective um, of our session today is to share some, you know, reflections on how to bring students closer to proactive teachers after COVID outbreak. As you probably remember, our project was divided into four stages. The first one, preparatory stage, so before we deliver classes, what we do, then delivery, then assessment, then evaluation. Mm -hmm. So now I would like you to share a little bit your experiences because we conducted this survey, a huge survey, like many students were um, uh, in, the, in this uh, survey, like I don't know, more than 200 students? Well, at our university it was like uh, 120 something. Yeah. yeah, but I from all universities, a huge number of students huge. involved. Huge number of students involved in this, in this survey, in this research. So it would be great to, uh, to to recognize this perspective. So let's get started with this, you know, preparatory phase. Frank, could you please tell us what have you discovered, like from student perspective, from teacher perspective? perspective, what is important in this delivery, in this preparatory stage, before mm -hmm. we deliver, we conduct our classes? 
Okay, um, at first I must mention we, we did this survey and there were some minor technical problems with oh. the survey because there was no real process doing the survey and there was also some leg legislative problems. So we did it with Moodle, with help of Moodle or by email. Yes. But then after some time we introduced this process of doing a survey mm -hmm. and that, that was also a bit challenge. Yeah. But uh, now we did it, and now we can do this. Know the way how to do this so wise mm -hmm. in a better way. That mm -hmm. first was some introduction mm -hmm. problems, um, and the outcome was for student preparations. Now we ha had good feedback. Yeah, mm -hmm. we we also entered it in our report, and the preparation for the lectures, I think they totally totally changed. Yeah, for the mm -hmm. students. Uh, of course, they used Moodle. Moodle was already introduced. You can use it before the lecture. That was also an advantage for us. It was maybe not so well accepted. It was the starting time of Moodle, but uh, it was there in the right moment, and we could use it. Then we had for uh, preparation of the lectures mainly two different <coughs> online tools, um, Big Blue Button and Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the school wanted us to use Big Blue Button, but the preparation, I think, it has some deficits. And I think the students accept Microsoft Teams more. Mm -hmm. And what we do for the preparation, um, yeah, we, uh, in this time I was giving mathematics, for example, mm -hmm. and we changed the lectures a bit. We call it Learn Team Coaching. We did this also before in other classes, but it means that the students have to prepare the lectures before mm -hmm. we give them to them. Yeah, we, had, we made good handouts, there's a lot of work doing handouts. We also mm -hmm. did for the calculations YouTube videos, because YouTube is really stable, more yeah. stable than Moodle. And then we gave it before the lectures to the students, and they should prepare it. Okay. And what we did then, Normally, a class is, uh, it was approximately 100 students in one lecture, three hours, front-loading lecture. And we changed the organization of these classes. We divided the, the 100 students in smaller teams, six, seven persons, and then we only made lectures for half an hour online, and they had to prepare it, and then we checked it if they did it. We, asked, we challenged them, we asked them questions, we asked them for some calculations, but we didn't ask for all um, the material of the lecture. And I think that was a good way to challenge them, not too hard. Yeah. Um, and, but if you have, you, can, you, you know it, if you have a MS Teams lecture online with 100 people, yeah. you, can be. you can't do anything. Yeah? Of course. You have to build smaller groups and control them better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was preparation. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. Paolo, did you change anything uh, in your preparatory before you started online classes with students? How was well, you, your perspective? A civil engineer, it's also very challenging no, the, the first area. challenge was, of course, to know how to work with all, all the, the tools because the university already had the the tools like um, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and Moodle, we, we have uh, all that already available. Of course, we're not using it uh, in a regular basis. <laughs> now we all use it on a regular basis. And it was uh, difficult to know all those things together, but uh, fortunately, the university provides lots of uh, small uh, workshops to, to learn how to use the tools and uh, even some workshops during the, the semester to people share their experiences, which was, which was good because we know that we are not alone on, the, <laughs> on those things. And also because the, the semester is, well, from, at least from my personal experience, the, the semester was on, already started, so we already know the students. Uh, they're not completely new, to, to at least for, for me, for, for, for the course that I was teaching. So we talked to them and tried to, because we are 
try to make them understand that we're all together on this adventure and that some things ca could go wrong, but okay, we are <laughs> we're all together, we can be some uh, flexibility on, on the tool, on the, on the rules. Mm -hmm. And I think also that from the university point of view, there is also some kind of flexibility to, to change uh, things and we, we know that we have to adapt to some, 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 some things. And it is, it was very interesting because I think that in the end we all learn uh, lots of new things with this uh, situation, lots of new tools, lots of new ways to, to give uh, lectures and to actually to meet with each other because sometimes it's much easier now because uh, online, uh, like Zoom, online tools like Zoom are very easy and it provides actually more uh, another uh, ways to be in contact with students. And in, in, again, in my personal case, whenever they have some uh, difficulties, because we are on lockdown, so it's easy to find time to additional lectures and so on. So in the, when I was doing my, the summaries of the, all the lessons that I've given, I, I found that I give like more 50% of the lectures <laughs> that were supposed to be, because whenever they have uh, some doubts or some questions, I give additional lecture, it's, it was easy, it wasn't, we, have not, we are locked down at home, they are also locked down, so it was easy to, to do that, so it was very interesting from that point of view. Yeah. Saraya, do you think students, they prepare in different way right now for classes, or the same if as previously? Made, no, I think, I, think, I think maybe I could be heard, right? Uh, but, but, no, no? Oh, okay, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. If they are doing differently now, to me, yeah. Okay. Now, now well, from the beginning of you know this COVID outbreak, like yeah. Um, well, I think the I think the workload has increased um, since since uh, so both teachers and students' workload have increased there because they um, the style teaching style was different. It was more based on projects. So it seems that now all teachers. Um, uh, evaluate, you know, we're asking for uh, for papers, for long papers, for for long projects. So they have to work on that apart from the exams. So they complain, and uh, according to the to the surveys, um, they um, they show that they have uh, the work the workload has increased both for for teachers because we have to change our teaching style now face to face, but also. A hybrid or online, and also for the students, because they have to do more, more projects, more uh, longer papers. Um, so that one of the of the changes, actually. Uh, also, at the beginning, the, uh, according to the sur surveys, teachers were complaining that they didn't, they didn't have a um, um, computer, personal computers, computers when they had to work uh, from home. Yeah. But our university um, supplied for that or tried to um, just to get to offer. Um, personal computers to, to teachers. I think um, students uh, work according to the service with different uh, devices, uh, mobiles or tablets, iPads and computers, but the teachers, we, we really needed a, a, a computer and actually our personal computer, our personal internet. Also, internet continues to be a problem because the connection is not always uh, available in all places and it was, it was also in the surveys and I still, I think it is still um, actually is, is, is there. Because uh, there are there are some students who work um, who live in remote villages and they don't have internet connection when they have to work. So it's, it's still it was a, an issue and it is still an issue. And um, students' is isolation it was uh, also mentioned, but in a low rate actually. So I think no, I mean it was only a 16th percent. So I don't think they, I think we we teachers uh, were trying to um, to be in contact with them. Uh, so isolation was not really really high. And um, what is uh, still a problem or an issue is um, to do practical um, context online. <clears throat> Laboratory or practical context, uh, specifically in the engineering or, or uh, scientific areas, when they have to work in the labs, it's very difficult to work on that um, online. Mm -hmm. It was an, and it was also in the surveys, it was an issue before, and I think it is an issue still if we want to just to work on, on laboratories on, on, the, on that. So. A huge challenge I um, I faced was you know the students hidden behind this dark screen, 
and I asked them so many times to switch on cameras and I didn't manage. It was like one of my biggest failures um, from this period think, because it's extremely difficult to, to be proactive, to be, you know, motivating, engaging. When you see only, the only thing you see is it's like a dark screen. Yeah. So. But you don't know if they really don't want to show up or because they say they say they didn't have any camera. So you have to trust. Do they have, don't they have yes, really a exactly. camera or do they want to yes. switch on the, cam the, the, yeah. the camera yeah, because they are in pyjamas yeah. or even that. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, yeah, but yeah, it's very frustrating yeah. to, to be lecturing to a, a black screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the beginning, I also asked them, show your camera that I can see your face. I want to talk with them. But at the end, we get so professional, I didn't want to see it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think for them, it was also, um, we accepted it. Of course, yeah. they came maybe out of the bathroom or something like this. And so, and it worked. And yeah. at the end, it worked without camera, Yeah, I think, for me. But what, what I learned is like, Every time I ask to switch on camera, it was no problem. Like yeah. this is, so yeah, this is like. But when I forgot to to ask, then usually I was talking to the you know dark screen. Yeah, but I think at the first time of the pandemic, we all tried to get them to the camera, and they tried to prepare themselves for camera and try to look at each other. Yeah. But at the end there was an acceptance that it is not necessary. And that yeah. was really a learning process. Yeah? Yeah. And now, um, being honest, before I, I thought it was not kind if someone didn't show his face mm -hmm. if he talks to me. But now, I think it doesn't matter. I can talk with him without camera. Yeah. yeah. There was a change, mind change. Yeah, bit, yeah? yeah maybe. maybe. Yeah. Okay, let's share with our audience what are the most effective tools or, uh, I don't know, teaching strategies, whatever you want, that, uh, you know, really, um, the, well, the, an answer to, to our learners' needs, okay? Because we, we know from our survey that there are some, you know, tools, some techniques, some strategies that really work but they are also other that students don't like at all. So could you please share with us, uh, maybe Natalia, you could tell us what are the most effective ones, fruitful ones you yes, used? Uh, according to the survey that we yeah. make in the University of Aveiro, the most effective activities for online teaching was solving exercise, okay. watching videos, taking notes, expository real-time classes from teachers. The things that people, the students don't like is to uh, evaluate uh, assessments of uh, the, their colleagues. Peer, uh -huh. yes, they don't so like. So peer assessment No, is they not don't like, no. Really? No. Okay. And it, it, it was uh, because of the, the idea of, it is not important to be a camera on yeah. or off in our, in the University of Aveiro. Mm -hmm. I suppose that ma the majority of the students was with camera off. But in the survey, they said more than 65%, they said that it's very important to, to be camera on. <laughs> but in fact, they were <laughs> camera <laughs> off. <laughs> yes. That's no, interesting. And, and, and the yes, it's strange, That's yes. And also, uh, the majority of the students and teachers of the University of Aveiro uh, that reply, uh, answered the survey, they prefer more than 70%, they prefer on-campus um, teaching than uh, online, yes. Mm -hmm. Professor Juncker, how does it look from your perspective of a vice president? What, what are the most effective and not really, you know, cost-consuming <laughs> maybe methods, uh, but on the other side, useful um, for students and for teachers? What do you think? Well, um, of course we tried a lot during the pandemic situation, like who would like my robot, um, like normal online uh, lectures, which were just um, like, in, like, in a, like in a presence, they just filmed it and it's more or less the same as in the classroom, which is not the best situation, but that was the beginning. Uh, let me take a look in the future. So. What, what can we take for the future? 
kind of, of teaching. And perhaps that's the idea. So I'm, the, the big issue was when the pandemic situation was over that a lot of people thought, okay, we go back. We go back to walk and chalk, like I mentioned before. And that's not the situation. But the problem is, if you like to combine online teaching and presence teaching, it does not fit in your daily schedule because you can't ask the students to come from 10 to 12 in an online session and from 12 to 2 in a presence session. So the idea is, and that's what we already heard here, like blended learning or hybrid learning, that you probably do the, the fundamentals online in self-study situation and you go in the exercises, in the laboratories, in presence. But for that, you need, for example, to deal with, let's call it an online day. Mm -hmm. So Monday is the online day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because then it's, it's clear that there's no presence and the students can stay at home, they can do their yeah. online whatever. And on Tuesday, they have to come in the laboratories, in the presence exercises and stuff like that. But that, the problem is that is, and that's from my perspective, and I think all of you know the problem, some colleagues, they said, I did lectures on Monday for the last 20 years. <laughs> and now you come and say, I am not allowed to do a present lecture on Monday anymore because <laughs> this is your online day now. <laughs> so, well, just kidding, but the situation is definitely the problem. So, yeah. we have to deal with our colleagues that they have to be more flexible. Yeah. Because Monday is just an example, it yeah. could also be whatever day. But then the colleagues have to be flexible with their presence lectures. Yeah. And that's a big thing, because well, we, we all love our freedom being professors. Yeah. We don't want someone to tell me when I have to do my work <laughs> and, and how I do I have to yeah. do my work. But if we go in the future of, of, of learning like that, like blended, like hybrid, we have to do some yeah. framework. And that's what we are dis discussing at the moment. Yeah. So that was not a precise answer to your question, but I think this is the outlook, what we need yeah. from, from the pandemic situation. Yeah, for sure. It's like <laughs> definitely this COVID has changed the uh, educational reality. Right now we will work in a very different way. Yeah. Ada, what is the most, you know, <coughs> well, useful or effective, I don't know, teaching and learning strategy? That you discovered well, at our university? I think that uh, I might share something that was most striking to me, okay? Because actually students, when asked about the different, you know, tools, what, what they liked, what they did not like, the distribution, you know, of points was, uh, was pretty similar. Yeah, some liked, I don't know, Kahoot, Mentimeter, uh, Miro, everything, okay? Co collaborative tasks or individual work, everything. But what was striking was... Uh, what uh, they actually told us about uh, motivation. So when asked what, what really could help to, um, for them to be more motivated, they actually mentioned three things. One was a clear learning plan. Two, more self-assessment and progress checks. And three, online support from the teacher. Um, and I think that these are the areas that uh, still need quite a lot of work yeah. um, at our university, but probably elsewhere as well. Yeah. Okay, and um, the kind of awareness that it's very often not the matter of tools, not the matter of content, but actually the matter of what, what you do with them. Okay, uh, so I guess that was the biggest lesson learned mm -hmm. uh, for us. Okay, mm -hmm. so. The feedback, the, the, the checks, the just teacher time to approach them as what Janet said, to approach them as students, okay, and not like teaching content, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So probably that in short. Okay. You mentioned self-assessment, and it is true that this assessment part was, was very difficult, very challenging for us. So... Rosa, maybe you could tell us how did you manage to assess in a, you know, this re reliable way your students? Well, for, um, in general, for, for teachers in the University of Alcalá, um, they affirmed in the survey that 
this was one of the, the worst uh, moments, the, the biggest challenge, challenge when, when they have to, to, uh, to assess the, the knowledge of the, the students. Because in reality, uh, we don't rely on, on the students. Um, uh, it was, um, I think, that the, the, the worst moment for, for all my colleagues in the University of Alcalá. And it's curious because uh, I thought that for for students uh, they they will they will like that that kind of, of assessment because they can make can tricky or but even uh, students doesn't like they, uh, did, uh, they didn't like uh, um, that kind of, of assessment. Um, it's very difficult and very controversial how to how to assess the the, the students. Um, um, we use uh, per assessment, but um, even the the students prefer being assessment uh, be be assessed uh, by the teachers also. Yes. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Paula, how did you assess your students? You know, practical skills, civil engineering skills. I cannot, you know, <laughs> imagine how well, to do that fr from. Uh, my personal experience, I, I, I really have no problem with online assessment because oh. they no, <laughs> because they are already in uh, even in written exercises they can have some uh, doc written documents with them so they can uh, consult things so well online they can easily talk to each other eventually, <laughs> but uh, for me personally it's not a problem. But I know that f for some of my colleagues it was uh, really a problem. So in in general, we have they have to do uh, the exam with uh, online one at least one camera. Sometimes some teachers demand that they have two cameras, like the the, the front cam and the phone on side, so they can see their workspace to see if they are not cheating at all. But uh, I think that that's not the or at least for me it's not really a, a big issue. The, the the assessment. The, the, the issue for me in the beginning was that in the course that I was lecturing that uh, semester, I have five um, uh, small tests during the semester. And suddenly, I, well, I have to do five online tests uh, without knowing how to, to do them. It was difficult to, to change it somehow. And sometimes there are some difficult problems, like, for instance, one example that I was trying to put the test online and it, I couldn't because the server was down. Mm -hmm. Then the server was okay and I put it in the middle of the night, the test there. And then somehow the, the, um, the server reboot with the Central European time, time instead of the Portuguese time. So when they start the exam, it was already time to finish. So they <laughs> go on and on simultaneously to the, oh, now how can I do that? So there's those kind of, of issues. but. Well, there are technical issues that we are. We have to be. So you trusted your students, but they were not cheating and so on. Uh, pretty much, like yes. Supported, <laughs> sub okay. I know that they. they, That's they important. I know they can they can cheat, but I I also know that I cannot prevent them from cheating if they even if they are on on classes. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's a point. I kind of trust them, but I, and uh, regarding peer assessment, they. At least my students, they don't like it at all. And I, I force them to do some in, in some situations, but they really don't like it, okay. at least in the beginning. Then after, because I, I do that some, on some online presentations or so, that they have to assess each other. And in the beginning, it was hard. They don't like it. But in the end, they felt that it's not so difficult at all. And as long as you are constructive, not destructive, it would, it goes okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Frank. What about you? How did you assess your student in a reliable way? Yeah, um, I could do it online, of course, and I think you can see a lot online. But for us, it's always um, important to know them a bit, yeah, to get in contact with them, to speak with them, and I think I need this to access them also and a really good way is um, I think that's also a bit outlook to the future what we will need a type of bonding we did it really well in the project maybe the sailing evalu 
event last week, yeah, and now when I saw the video from last year, uh, I mentioned that five of these guys are now in our master's program for industrial right. engineering. And I think this is a type of assessment, but this is also a type, a kind of bonding. Yeah? You have to plan events, maybe sailing event or shipping event, uh, mm -hmm. to get in contact with the guys, and then they follow you, and then you can do online teaching as you like. I think that's, that's a new form of yes. a, a type of event. I would call it event teaching or so. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, as we are running out of time, uh, I'd like you to share the very last uh, lesson you learn from, from this project, from this survey, maybe what motivates the student the most. And uh, one sentence by, by one, for one person, starting from Ada, yeah, that's oh a good point. Oh my gosh. How to say one, in one Ada. sentence? I know you have a lot well, of... Well, the one sentence is that uh, there is no way we can come back to the old ways. Right, so um, the pandemic period has taught us a lot, a lot of good things, uh, and we should do our best to just keep them, okay? So um, this blended mode for sure is our future, is our reality. Uh, we can't just come back to on-campus, in-person teaching and just, you know, stick to it, right? So we need to find ways, even those logistics challenges uh, mentioned here yeah with planning which day is online which day is you know on campus but we have to really take up this challenge and just do what we should do okay, okay. thank you Ada. frank yeah for me motivation and activation is a, a key topic you you have to show them the sea and then they have to build the boat on their own <laughs> Okay. To do. Well, what, what impressed me much was the sentence Janet showed us. So uh, I think that's a very good final sentence, how to motivate students in that new situation. It's as soon as they realize that we teach them and not the topic. <laughs> and then they are motivated. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Uh, we are in digital area and teachers shouldn't remain indifferent. Um, so we should take advantages of all that we have learned and all the time and money that we have spent. So uh, we should uh, help to make it possible to combine the best of both worlds, uh, presencial, face-to-face -face, and uh, virtual. Thank you so much. Very difficult to summarize everything in just one sentence, but um, I truly believe that social active interaction is a must for motivation and content acquisition. Um, a neurologist um, say that t uh, students learn when they are motivated, so I think we have to provide um, motivating, um, active, dynamic activities to students in uh, digital, because we are in this digital area. Yeah. Yes, it's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think that, uh, as my colleague says, it is very important to motivate the students, to engage the students during classes. I'm not a really fan to be uh, online uh, course, uh, uh, all online. Blended, um, maybe, yes. Because I think that this, it is very important for teachers to be with the students, to see their faces, to see if they are learning what we are uh, teaching, because with the black screen, I think this is not motivating for the teachers. And if the teachers are not motivated, the students will not be motivated to, to learn. Yeah. I agree. Thank you, Natalia. Paolo. Well, well, for me, Matt, the, the most important thing of this all, it was how much we can do. Because in one week, we change everything. We and our students, and we are capable of doing that. So sometimes, I think we just don't do more because we get somehow accommodated, so we get to be pushed somehow to do things because we all show us and the students and everyone that can change from very suddenly to a completely different situation. So that's, for me, what's the most important thing about all this. Thank you, Paola. 
And for me, there's what I feel, this is the strong need of flexibility in every single you know, part of our teaching and learning process. Okay, thank you very much. We are running out of time, to, so thank you. Please join me in applauding our great panelists. Thank you very much for providing this survey. And uh, you know, all this right idea can be found in our toolbox. Toolbox will be presented by, uh, by Soraya and Rosa uh, downstairs during our uh, workshop. Oh, no, sorry, here. here, here, toolbox here. Oh my gosh, here. Uh, but of course, um, Phil also invited for our uh, workshops about micro credentials, about uh, and about gamification. It will be led by by Frank. But before you leave, we leave for lunch. I would like Monica to yes. Okay. So guys, do you know what gadget is in your pocket? Can I can I yes. get one? What this? Do you know how it works? This is, as you, as you probably know, our project is about the STEAM, okay? So that is why we wanted you to get a very specific gadget, the STEAM gadget, S-T-E-M. And Monica will now show you how it works and will teach us, not subject, teach us how to use this unique equipment. Well, I think that there's nothing to teach. You can see the instruction. <laughs> no, it's, it's simply very easy. It's enough if you uh, move the side switch into the on position and then just pair your smartphone. Okay. So As let's any take other picture. device. Okay, guys, now the challenge is we need to take the picture of all of us. So please move to the stairs. And Monica will show you how it works. The clicker. Okay. I should take my smartphone, I guess. Yes. Okay. So let's move to, to the center. We as well? Yes, you too. Of course. You are, you know. Okay. Let's take a picture. Uh, we have a list, so I will give you a list.
Um, we will try to make it as practical as possible and we will try to share um, different uh, resources and tools that you could use in your classroom. So we are going to be as practical as possible. Um, what we are going to see is in the um, project uh, website. Uh, it is e -close, um goods because it's there. I think um, you, you, got, uh, you got it in the email. 
And if you go to outputs, uh, we will, in this workshop, we will um, focus on these two in methodology of interactive asynchronous and synchronous online. So we will, um, uh, we will present uh, survival kits and some methodologies. And now we will start with distant teaching uh, toolbox for educators or GitHub. So in this part, uh, my, my partner Rosa will focus on this. I will continue with the other two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to show you um, the. Okay. That's okay. Okay, so. Um, um, the toolbox is a repository of uh, tools and resources that uh, can help in order to to change the methodologies um, and, for example, to to make more active your classes. And um, well, um, okay, this is well, this is not my computer. Uh, I think so. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, as I told you, it's, uh, Toolbox is a database of active learning methods and techniques. More than um, techniques and methods are tools, tools and resources. And here, um, is, um, we have created this database in GitHub. I don't know if you, you, know, uh, you, know, you know what is uh, GitHub? Some of you, can you raise your hand with one? Did you see it? Well, it's uh, millions of developers around the world use GitHub as a um, repository and also to, to collaborate in different millions of problems, of, of projects, sorry. Um, well, um, we have created in this GitHub um, a database um, that we have divided into two main categories resources and tools and all of them are um, um, categorized by uh, different um, labels audio design image uh, for example for resources and for tools you have uh, audio cognitive collaboration communication different tools and you can i'm going to show you now in github this is a powerpoint presentation but if you uh, click in one of these labels, you can see all of the tools. We have here in this database uh, more than 200 uh, different tools that we have uh, um, put in this um, database. Okay. Okay. This is something that I need. Ah, okay, much better. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, here you can see just a little bit, uh, even you can uh, click in any of the logos and you can go uh, to a little page with uh, some uh, the, a short definition of the, of the tool and also some characteristics and links and other tools that are similar. So here you have uh, resources and also tools Okay, and we have um, created um, every tool is a file, it's an MD, the, station, the extension of the file is MD for a markdown language. Okay, so uh, you can um, see in a graphical way or in a issue section. I'm going to show you. Okay, so GitHub and also eClose Toolbox are open source project that means that you can collaborate and in fact we would like to it to be a living thing uh, all you need is a github account i'm going to show you it's very quickly and very uh, fast to create a, an account in github so this is something that we can we can do do you have a laptop here some of you Yes, I, I'm going to explain how to do it and then uh, you can go to the link of Git, GitHub um, eClose Toolbox and you can collaborate if you want. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm going to explain just a little bit how to contribute. Um, uh, you have uh, in our wiki, 
that is inside of the the toolbox um, GitHub toolbox. Uh, the wiki uh, in the wiki you have the explanation um, about how to contribute. You can do it in two different ways. Uh, one is to uh, create a new issue. Another one is to uh, create uh, another tool that you think that uh, is not uh, in the in the toolbox, and um, then. Uh, um, Administrator has to um, give permission in order to put into the toolbox. So uh, I told you that every file or every tool is a file, an MD, uh, MD file. That is, it's something like that. It's just a um, very, very short definition. You have the tool name with a link, with a, uh, uh, with a logo, with the logo of the tool, a brief description, some interesting links, additional reference, and also some uh, similar tools. And I'm, uh, you have to, to know to uh, edit in GitHub. First, you have to know how to use Markdown. It's not, it's not uh, very difficult, it's more, more or less uh, easy. Is Markdown is an editor, it's a um, um, friendly text to HTML conversion tool. And also, you can, if you go to this address, Dillinger.io, here you can see, I'm going to show you a moment how um, Markdown editor works, something like that. It's um, online, you can change, for example, um, here you can see. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I don't know how to do it. If I, I think that we are going to do um, a little bit later. I'm going to continue with the presentation. Okay, let me show you again. I'm going to continue, and I'm going to show you Dillinger in a moment. So uh, in, inside of the GitHub, you have something like that. Every tool has a file, an MD file, that is something like that. I, I think that it, it doesn't deserve to show very much because I suppose it's not easy to, to see. And this, if you click on preview, you can see something like that. For example, this is Active Present. This is a, it's a screencasting um, video editor. And you have here the definition, the link, uh, additional details, some references, and other characteristics of the GitHub. And also you can see here, well, you can't, but here appears the uh, category of the, this, this tool. And um, well, um, I'm going to show you a little bit in the presentation and then we are going to, to toolbox. So for example, here you can see a little bit of the, uh, how uh, Markdown works. Here is more or less the, the way that you can preview this, uh, this text that appear here. This is written in uh, M Markdown. As you can see, for example, this uh, line here that is uh, record screen, create demos, etc., is this line here of flat test. Flat test, you write, you written something like that and appears like, like this. This uh, name, active presenter, in, uh, in brackets, appears like that. And then here you can see the link. When you click in this uh, text, active present, you go to the link of the active presenter, okay? And then this, is, this uh, text here is the uh, links of these uh, labels. Okay, okay, yes, that's true, that's true. I think that is much better if I do like, like this. So for example, here you can see this text here is the active present name and the link. And then here is this uh, part of the these um, two images of the of the labels. Here is the an image that um, is. Uh, by the way, this um, image is into a um, um, directory folder in a folder that is called uh, images. Here, so all the images. All the logos of the of the um, toolbox that appears in, in toolbox are inside of the folder images. So, 
it could be in, in another places, but we have decided that uh, in order to be more efficient, all of the logos are in, into the, the images folder. So here is the, the, um, the image, a file PNG. And for example, as, as I told you, the, the flat text like that appears as you can see. And for example, uh, in bold, when you put these uh, um, characters here, two characters appears in bold, more or less. It's not, it's not something that I want that you learn now, but uh, um, it, you can, if you want to collaborate, you have to copy any of the tool and just, just change by the name of the, your tool, the name of your uh, image, and that's all, it's quite easy. Okay, so as I told you, this is the, the, um, the, P, um, the MD file, and this is the, the way you can see, okay? So, well, I'm, I'm, uh, now I'm going to, to tell you a little bit how to contribute. If you go to the wiki, you can see uh, two ways to contribute to add uh, some tools. For example, the, I think that the best, not, not the best, but the easiest, the easier is uh, to raise a new, a new issue. And you have to click here, and that's all. I'm going to, to show you in a moment. Or other way is to pull, uh, generate a pull request. In any way, um, only an administrator can uh, upload to the toolbox. Okay, so. Okay, uh, this is the first, the first way. So you have to add a file. I'm going to show you in, in direct. But uh, you can uh, have a file, so you can create a new file, you can edit or you can copy and paste. And then uh, and don't, uh, remember that you have to put the name uh, with an extension MD. Okay, so you preview and is everything is okay. You have to propose a new file. When you propose a new file, you create a new pull request. And then when you propose a, a new, um, um, a new uh, tool, uh, an administrator see that there are a new pull records. So he has to merge pull requests, and that's all. I think this is more difficult. It's, more easy, it's easier if you um, create a new issue. And this is shorter to explain. You create a new file, and you edit, or you, um, as you can see, you can't but if you can uh, copy and paste uh, um, your text in MD uh, editor, and here you submit a new issue. And again, an administrator can transfer issue like this. So the administrator have to click and then transfer issue. That's all. Easy, more or less? Okay, so I'm going to show you how to how does it work? Okay. Yeah, first you have to create an account. I think that we don't have too much time and there are other things that, to, that we are going to explain, so I'm not going to lose too much time. So I prefer just to show you a little bit the, the, the tool and I think that's Okay, so now it's here. Okay, this is the GitHub. If you click, if you put in your navigator uh, github.com e close and you select toolbox here, you can see something like this. This is all the, here is the, for example, I think that it, we are going to start with the wiki. In the wiki, you can see how to contribute. You have three ways, and I explained you before the number two and the number three. And I think that the easiest is raise a new issue, just clicking a new issue. So, for example, they mean, you mean that if they want to contribute by adding a new resource, yeah. it's not there because this is a repository of mm -hmm. uh, resources. So, if they feel, if they know any new uh, tools that that's it. 
Mm -hmm. That's that is. So, for example, here there are two new issues that someone I created. So, if you, I have to uh, upload, I have to uh, click, and then I I can not this one. Ah, yes, transfer an issue. But how to collaborate? Okay, so I'm going to show you again from the beginning. I'm going to show you the. For example, here you can see all the resources and all the tools, and you can click and show a see in a graphical way like this by category: audio, cognitive, collaboration, communication. And if you go any of the logos here, you can see this tool, the description, additional details, references, and some interesting links. Okay, so if you want to create a new, uh, a new, you have to, for example, you can edit this file, and you can uh, copy the text, for example. Oh, I don't, I don't know how. What is the copy here? The first one. Ah, the the second. This one. Okay, copy. It has sense. Okay, so I have copied this, and then uh, I'm going to create a edit a file. How do you edit a file? Edit a new file. Edit, edit. In Polish, edit is line wrap mode. No. I don't know what. I don't know. Ah, maybe I have to go. Yes, yes. It's here. Oh, sorry. So sorry. So sorry. It's not. It. I have almost the same problem with English than in Polish. So. <laughs> okay. So I uh, create a new file. Sorry. As you can upload if you want. So here I can uh, paste this one. So here I can change, for example, uh, I can put uh, uh, something. Oops. Something. I put the link. Um, you don't need to, to know very much about MD editor. You have to, to change things here. That is easy, quite easy. Change the links. And when this is ready, you have to to put here, commit new file. Okay, so if you can preview first that everything is okay. And I don't know why I can't preview. Ah, because I have to, to give the name with the extension MD. So sorry, I'm not, uh, um, I don't know why. Ah, edit again. Which one? Okay, yes. Uh, Mine.md. Okay, and now I can preview. Okay, something, whatever. And now, if I am ready, I can commit new file. New file. Um, and then when you have create, you have to you follow in the wiki, you can see the annular, I suppose. Okay. You can see here the, the step to collaborate if you want. So I think that's everything from my side. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Um, okay. Now the other um, outputs that we created are in here. Are, uh, okay. So we were talking about the toolbox database in here. Uh, Rosa has been explaining it. Now we, I will revise very quickly the survival kits and the methodologies. Um, survival kit is just uh, in case you are uh, a five, right? Hmm.
Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. So, in case you are um, delivering an, an online workshop or an online classroom and, and you've got problems with connection, here are some ideas that can help you. Okay, and I will revise them very quickly. Um, so, if there are some issues related to inter internet connectivity or hardware issues, software issues, location issues, social issues, online class limitations. Okay, so in case you've got any of these cases, then you, there are some uh, resources here. So uh, this is divided into parts in protection and restoration. So um, you will see some, um, if the protection are the techniques applied before the class, and restoration are the techniques that you can apply or we can apply during the class. For example, uh, one of them is protection. Uh, uh, designate one student in charge of the internet connection. Imagine you're, you are dealing an online class and the connection uh, fails for the teacher on the internet. Then um, one possible idea is to um, designate one student to be in charge of telling the teaching uh, and keep the audience online. So you give them engaged, maybe one, maybe two, so it's a way of keeping them engaged. Um, then for restoration, the students are supposed to read about something. Uh, meanwhile, while this is not working, while the internet is not working, uh, you can ask your students to read about something from websites or from a book. Uh, maybe that you have emailed previously, or maybe you can send in an email or a text, or, or, or even before the class, uh, tell them, in case the, the connection fails, keep on reading this uh, while the connection is failing, so that they don't get bored. I'm, I'm sure all of us have contents and readings to do. Uh, another another um, tip is, um, is uh, for example, students uh, fill in a table on the on the on the whiteboard. Uh, meanwhile, uh, while this is not working, so they could summarize everything, or uh, the students join together at the session um, or be alternative media, maybe the phone. So you can allow your students to use the phone or the tablet or or, or anything. Uh, for example, another way for um, agree and uh, for, for restoration is uh, to ask students um, whether they agree or disagree, if, if the visible solution is correct or not by adding um, a whiteboard or sign. I mean, make them participant of what's going on. So what shall we do? Shall we do this? Shall we do that? So it's a way of keeping them engaged and not just um, um, disengaged from, from your contents, from your lessons. Uh, or dictation, uh, one of the students dictate the teacher what should be written instead of using software, for example, so they can also practice um, handwritten. Or searching, the student asks the students to search for an alternative software for the next session. Okay, the next task for the next session will be, I think that can apply for every, almost all the subjects. Or maybe we can make it related to content. Uh, ask for alternative software and you tell us, or you, you let us know what was your best um, proposal. Uh, for example, um, you can also define um, a mini game to play every time something occurs. For example, uh, they can uh, write a class session in the chat. Uh, so that's something, for example, I do with my students. We've got a forum, and um, if um, during the online lessons um, I just post um, a hypothesis or a, or, a, or a quotation. And they have to discuss in the chat about it, so they can add, they can search for references or for, and they, they discuss it in the forum. And actually, I I ask them to um, to give their their this their ideas or their um, their agreement with other um, um, opinions that have been made. So just keeping a class forum is could be also useful in case uh, not only for digi for for online teaching but also in general. I mean they can discuss or or have it there just in case something happens. Also, to, uh, another uh, another proposal is to incorporate the teacher incorporates the event in the class and tells a random anecdote about it. So imagine your internet connection fails. Maybe the students can just tell a story or a, an anecdote about uh, themselves or, or what was happening. For example, one anecdote that happens to me, I was in a conference, I giving a conference about how to teach online with digital teaching. 
So I was supposed to be mastering this online teaching and the internet connection failed and I was at my university so I, I, I wasn't doing it from my home, I went on purpose to university and it was quite embarrass embarrassing because I was supposed to you know, be, be knowing how, what, what the problems were and I couldn't solve them. So I mean, just uh, think, in, in case that it doesn't work, just think of a funny anecdote or, or, or just something. Um, uh, the, the idea is to keep them, not, not just to let them uh, uh, lose uh, connection with what, what you are saying. Another proposal is to judge. The task of the student is to notice possible mistakes, even of the teacher, and mention them in class. So maybe that could be sort of self-assessment, peer feedback, or even teacher feedback. We don't like to hear that, but maybe it could be useful to say, sometimes I say, how could I improve this? Or next time, in case this fails, how could we improve it? How, do you have ideas that could uh, help me improve? They're, they're usually nice. I mean, I, sometimes in the class, uh, when something I have a doubt or, or I see they are not following or they, I've got problem connections, I ask them. And, and, and say, have you, what, is, what was the mistake? Or how can, rather than what was the mistake, how could this be improved? And then another um, proposal is who's next, it's called. It is an active student designates the next student to the next task. Uh, I, I don't know if you do that in your classrooms, I do. I, for example, when I, I teach didactics, for example, and I ask them to prepare, I do flipped classroom. Um, so I, have, I ask them to, to, uh, to be the teacher themselves. So I say, okay, you are the teacher and you ask your, one of your classmates to explain the lesson. And the other person asks for to the other one. And they're really quite, I mean, they have fun. They laugh, no, don't choose me. But they, they enjoy doing it. I mean, that's, that's an, a nice thing we can do also in class. Uh, or silence. Uh, after explaining um, a lesson or a concept, a teacher mutes for a while and leaves the students to interact online. Uh, and it says there might be some initial silence after they start the interaction. But sometimes let them mute and say, OK, I, I will leave you mute. And then we will comment your proposals or your, your, your answers, your feedback. Well, maybe they have disappeared when, we, when they come back, but it's another thing. So, um, well, as it says there, uh, try our database full of tools and resources. That's what Rosa has been explaining in this GitHub. I mean, I don't think it will be possible to include a new resources or collaborate because I think most of the resources are there. I mean, you've got Kahoot, you've got Doodle, you've got uh, um, video conferencing, you've got, I think all possible tools are there. So I think she says, no, I mean, uh, it would be really, are there more, really? I mean, try, have a look. I think all the resources, mostly all the most useful resources that we are easy to use in class are there. So in case you don't know what to use, just click there because you will find all of them. So that the good thing of this project was that they were summarized or compiled in this one. So those were, this is a summary of the, of the task proposals if, in case, um, I mean, there are, there are um, few ones, but actually uh, easy to be, uh, to be put into practice by anyone. All right. So that was the um, uh, uh, survival kits. And now we will go to um, the other one, okay, to the methodology. So we were in the survival kits and we will finish with the methodology. This is really uh, extends, okay? So I invite you to, it is task one. So if you've got your mobile, I will show you, but I think it will be useful because um, uh, I think you just have to click there. It is task one. I think because the survival kit is task three. So I think it's the, it's the first one, right? Yes? Does it look like this? Okay. So, uh, okay, let's start. But I said it was going to be practical, but not too practical, like it, uh, right? So it looks like this. Um, it is uh, divided in, in, in a sort of it. Um, okay, sorry, yes. 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 Shall I put it bigger? Larger? It's fine? Okay. Okay. Yes, you've got it. Yeah. Okay. So um, it has um, eight uh, spaces. Okay. 
uh, um, they are divided into how complex they are, the form, the time, if they are time consuming, if they can be, so complexity to use at once, or if they really need more time, it depends on your lecture or your class. On the form, if they are online or stationary, if they are delivered in class or out of class, and if, it, if they can be done individually or in groups. So in case you, you've got, you, you, want to do, you, you want to plan your class, you just have to click and, and we will see some ideas. There are 90 pages, so we won't be able to cover all of them, so we will just go through some of them so that you can have an idea of, of what it's like. Okay, uh, first of all, um, let's start with, we are going to start with uh, to use at once, okay? And if we, if we click on to use at, one, at once, if you click there, you've got one which is called Venn diagram. Can you see the, the Venn diagram? Um, okay, so it's your turn. So can you please, in your nice notebook that uh, University of Goods provided, can you please draw these two circles in your notebook and write on the left how many dynamic methodologies you know? Can you please do it now? So just write two circles in your notebook and write how many dynamic methodologies you know, or methods or resources, anything you use or you, shall we say five or, you, or three or, I mean, three enough? Now it's difficult to think of, but when I tell you, say, oh yes, I know that one, oh, I know that one. So when I tell you, they say, you will say, yes, I know all of these. Okay, I mean, yes, all right. But you're Googling, yeah. But, I mean, that's, of course, we, we, why, we've got a mobile, we've got Google, why not? I mean, we are in the digital era, why not taking advantage of it? Okay, yeah, just enough. It's just to give, it's just to give, share an example. So the idea is that you write it them on the left, and now we can share them aloud, and you write it on the right, the ones you have learned from your, from your peers. So can any, one, any of you tell your methodologies or how many methodologies you know or you use? Any, anyone? I mean, we are a little group, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, because there are too many to differently structured. That's why, right? It shows some chemical, some <laughs> chemical formulas. Can you explain what you mean by dynamic? Yeah, uh, we are teaching now about how to teach in the classroom. For example, problem-based learning, PBL. So, do you use? Do you ask your students to do uh, projects? Sure, so project-based learning, PBL, that's a methodology. Do you use, for example, micro-teaching? No, maybe not. Sorry? Design thinking, for example, design thinking. So you should be writing the new ones on the, on the right. Another one, design thinking? Uh, gamification, do you use gamification? Kahoot, Doodle, or whatever? 
Um, do you use task-based learning, TBL? Uh, do you use cons the constructivist approach, uh, the, the peer feedback, all sort of feedback that the students are correct uh, or give feedback? So that's called const constructivism. Yeah? Okay. Well, um, we will, I'm not mentioning them because we are going to revise them now. Okay, so that's you to, for, uh, we will be revising them now, right? But this can be done as well with contents. Maybe you are going to start a new unit, or if you see that your students are losing interest in your lecture and your class, maybe you could revise, or you are going to start a new lesson, or just say, okay, how many do you know about this topic? And then you make them write it, and then share what they know, or maybe at the end of the lesson you can say, okay, this is what you have learned, because sometimes they know more than they think. So it's a way of showing, hey, you have learned all this. You thought you didn't, you thought these, these lessons were, uh, you, I mean, you, uh, useless, but see how much you have learned. So it's a way of, this can be applied not only with methodologies, but with contents from the classroom as well. The second one, I will make you work, okay, is that now you have to uh, write this uh, triangle, this sort of figure in your notebook in the second page. Can you please try to, um, so this is called triangle of commonalities, okay. This is also applied for getting to know each other, but also for sharing contents. Can you please draw this? Very big, very big in your notebook. Because um, you will have to work in, th uh, can you please uh, speak three people of you? And in the middle, you have to write commonalities. What common techniques do you use in your classroom? Can you find them out? And can you write, each of you write, what do you teach differently to your partner? Are you from the same areas? Because I see, oh no? Much better, because I mean, I don't know, because you are seated together, so I thought you may be from the same university. So could you please work in threes and ask yourselves, I'm sure you share some resources, techniques in your classroom. For example, project-based learning, task-based learning, constructivism, or even Kahoot, or can you please gather and say what you do this uh, in common and uh, in each, maybe one person can just write what they do differently. Maybe three things could be enough. The thing is, it's uh, in PDF, so you cannot write any, well, you could with an editor. Yeah. Got it more or less? Yeah. You've got something? Yes? Yeah. 
No differences. Okay. Although we are from different fields. But it's good, but it's good to share, because I mean, it, I think this. I mean, I actually, I, I put something um, Yeah, but um, I like this, this sort of conferences, because we know what the others are doing. And, and even from different countries or from different universities, we don't work that, that differently. And so it's, it's nice to see that we, we are in the same direction, or that we are, I mean, I, I, that, that's my view. So anyone could could tell please um, the, uh, what are your names or sorry could you tell me could you tell us could, shall we share could you tell what you've got in common From which, which faculties are you? So completely different. Yeah. And you say, research? I research by research, uh, problem by research, and I think this one has common for us. Okay, good. Okay. Um, what about you? Yes? Yeah. We do the same thing. We do mathematics. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we do some elements of flip, flip trust classroom. Okay, flip classroom. Okay. And teamwork and, and kind of team yeah. activities. Oh, that's good. Cool. Team activities or cooperative work. It's, it's, it's good, yeah. And flip classroom as well, because they can prepare it in advance, study in advance, and then solve. Okay, and then you solve the um, problems or activities with them. Uh, ideas. Yeah. Okay. It keeps them active. Actually, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we do, do group work too. Um, mm -hmm. I work group work a lot of that, and uh, usually connected with some project that the students are doing. Uh, we also join groups that usually don't have classes together to do different kinds of projects. Oh, and so interdisciplinary projects. Yes. Oh, that's great. That's good because uh, it's quite enriching. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so Something different with this Wookla? Yeah, I tell them that because uh, they use Kapoot or uh, this kind of tools. So, gamification. I tell them that for the uh, doing uh, questions during the class, I use Wookla. Uh -huh. And uh, they didn't know it, so it's Wookla. Oh, so you Wookla. 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 Creative interactive presentations, yeah. Or, or genially, I uh, don't know if you, yeah, as well, yeah. If, but you've got to save it, yeah. But that's, uh, okay. Interactive presentations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You see, we learn here, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And you are from which departments or areas? Mm -hmm. teachers. Well, you are really, I found out, at least in Spain, they are really uh, innovative and dynamic. I mean, I'm amazed all the things they are doing. I mean, uh, in secondary, I think they are doing sometimes more than our, because I've got uh, my, 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 my daughter and son are at, at secondary education, um, education, and they do more active um, uh, activities than we do at university, and really lo with lots of contents, and uh, they really learn a lot. So, congratulations. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed how much it has evolved and how much you do. So actually because it actually started before the pandemic. During the pandemic yes. it actually helped us a lot that we already had yes. skills and tools. Yeah. I, f I find it as well. Um, after the pandemic I think secondary school has um, hired um, its level. Yeah. It's more more dynamic, more practical, more uh, it works a lot with uh, I don't know, do you work with um, with platforms where the students have to upload their work? For example, so it's very collaborative as well. So they have to upload their their so works and work on one single file, mm -hmm. upload it to yes. Teams, for example, yeah. uh, or like a PowerPoint presentation, or yeah. even a word document where they add different things, uh, to create material, material for revising yeah. later on, for example. I think so that's very interesting. I think that we, ha uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, 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 very much to learn about secondary teachers. Because uh, in the universities, uh, everything uh, 
like seems more serious. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So I think that you do yes. great. Yes, and also they are learning about how to do presentations. I feel that now students at secondary are, are taught how to do presentations. And before the pandemic, I felt it wasn't done, but now they have to do presentations in the classroom with PowerPoint and so on. So I'm amazed. They use PowerPoint, they use uh, Prezi. Oh, Prezi as well, yes, yes. Yeah. So they come to university really well, qualified, so okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I, I thought it was only, you know, at, at our place, but I'm, I'm happy to hear it's also <laughs> in yours. We got the invitation, so we decided to, to attend. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, have you got any... <laughs> okay, I'm also from a secondary school, so the same situation here. So I work with teenagers and mostly uh, we use the same techniques as uh, teachers here had just explained. I also focus on a lot of games and songs and also I work with Google Maps a lot where they find Sorry. the different uh, uh, information or photos about the text we cover. So that's basically how we uh, interact with the whole world via that uh, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And my colleague here is from a different faculty. <laughs> I'm from the uh, university, and uh, most of all we use scissor thinking, and we are not so it's Um, it's good to know, um, to, you use, for example, Google Maps and so on, maybe for geography or... Yeah. And I think that's so practical, because they, students nowadays, they don't know what is in the book. Exactly. But they, so it's, we are teaching the real world. I think that's of the key points of education, to, to make it real, exactly. to work with real contents so that they are aware that we are yes. teaching. Exactly, sometimes their, their general knowledge is really basic. And if the text is, is, a, is about some kind of a distant country that they never heard of, it's good to look it up uh, online. And uh, if they find it on their own and they see the pictures, they can locate it on the world map, on the globe, then it's so much easier for them to identify with the place and actually uh, find the text interesting from the textbook. Yes, yeah, so. Not only memorize it, you know, and say all the capitals from yeah. Europe or whatever, but know where they are because they have search for that. Yeah. That's how they, I mean, by being practical, that's how you learn. And it's really important for university teachers to know what they, you are doing at secondary, to know what kind of students we are getting or where, where the level is. So it's really important for us to know. And um, where have you got any suggestions, any proposals? No? Okay. Um, okay, let's go because we don't have much time. I just will go to the tool uh, itself. Okay, um, so there is in this in this tool you've got this mind map where it's interactive. It can take you to whichever part. Okay, so for example, let's let's click on here to use at once. Well, I'm, I'm, I just uh, it is in generally, but uh, for this presentation, I just put it in, in, on PDF. For example, to work on, uh, and why is not why is not leading me? Oh, oh no! Because it's not online. Because it's not online. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Anyway, anyway, um, have you used any of these? For example, now we have used the uh, sort of um, it's not a Venn sort of Venn diagram. We have sort of used it. Um, Infographics, do you use them? Because, I mean, oh, I should, okay, I will go. Because I, I should go online. But um, it's not working on the, um, on, um, I don't want to go, because it's, you know, in the, it's not working. Now, okay, now, it's here, all right. Sorry, I wasn't the other one. So, for example, infographics. Uh, have you used infographics to, um, for your students in your classroom? So, I'm sure you, uh, you have used them. Uh, so, if it explains you any of the, of the tools, for example, to use at once, uh, which one would you like me to stop? And because uh, we won't have time to revise all of them. Uh, 
Anyone you are interested in? Okay, concept map. Okay, for example, concept map. Divide students in equal groups. Ask the students to work in the classroom on a topic. Uh, students write down associations with the topic or basic issues. Students develop these topics and add the new level and they continue until an association are used. And you've got a link here to a video and it explains. I think mm, I have to. Yes. No. Uh, it's already because I had the here it is. Mm, yeah. Okay, so it so it is so for every every uh, resource every method you've got a link which uh, um, links you to a video or to an explanation on how to do it, for example. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this is how to do it, but of course you can adapt it in your class. Flexibility is, is, um, is mandatory. So maybe there are too many steps, but then you can adapt the concept map about you, you give them a concept and they have to work in groups and you, you can adapt it to your students and do it as, as you prefer in class. Okay, and you mentioned as well, which one? Gallery work, yeah. Well, this is if you want your students to move, which sometimes in the classroom, maybe for a Friday afternoon, <laughs> the last could be, okay? So divide the students into groups, uh, attach posters with tasks for each group, uh, which also requires work for the teacher. So it's also time consuming for the teacher because you have to prepare this in advance. So we have to take this into consideration because we as teachers not only have to deal, uh, prepare contents, but also prepare the activities, you know? So the groups create their poster solutions. Each group must have at least as many members as there are tasks. A new division follows, one person from the group for each poster. The poster creator tells the story. A rotation continues, all posters are, are cleared. I present the authors of the best um, of the presenter. And you've got the link here. Uh, yeah, let's see, for example. So maybe this is different of doing just a PowerPoint presentation because if they just do it in one infographic, it could be a poster by hand or could be an infographic. So it may, maybe this is more dynamic than just a PowerPoint presentation, which you know they have to just uh, listen for five minutes and in the end they get tired. So if, if there is just one page, everything very visual with many uh, points, as sort, sort of as we do in conferences with all our method results, results, conclusions, and so on, they can they communicate because they they explain to the others and they move to the others. So maybe. This one is more um, dynamic than just doing a PowerPoint presentation, right? depending on, on how we um, focus. Okay, uh, maybe for example, um, online, uh, uh, for example, of oh, flip classroom, we know it, gamification, it explains how it does, uh, case, case study, we, we know it. So, um, for example, student teams achievement, this is how to work in teams and assign a task uh, to a group. And each student is responsible for each teammate. That's important when we, when we work in groups to just appoint one responsible for the group or um, key speaker. Okay. Um, it means that I've got five minutes only. No, do I? <laughs> so any, okay. Uh, just in case you've got, for example, in class, uh, there are different, as you can see here, there are many different uh, peer assessment. So they give you tips on how to work on, on that. Many of them, I'm sure you use them in your class without knowing that you are using it. But uh, just, uh, it's, it won't be possible, but just click on here and uh, in case sometimes you you don't know what to do in class. I'm sure you, you know, but 
Uh, we've got to take into consideration that um, we, we have to keep our students motivated because if, I mean, sometimes we look at them and their faces and we see that they are not following. So maybe we could have, just have a look at some of these and, and have it prepared and in case we, we see they are not following, we could maybe say, okay, let's move, let's do this. Of course, we will feel comfortable with some of these uh, resources, not with, with some others. Uh, for example, I like very much micro teaching. I tell you my favorite ones: uh, or gamification. Um, well, I mean gamification. We know what it is. Is there any? Is there any um, any part you would like to have a look at? Because some of them can be um, invent exam questions. Could be could be useful. Okay. Uh, create exam, okay, learners create exam questions themselves. And sometimes I think they are harder than we are. <laughs> Even when we ask them to assess themselves, they are harder than we are sometimes. So, oh my God, they are, but not with their peer mates, with themselves. So maybe sometimes um, if they have to create an exam question and they have to um, look for the answer, they usually learn that better than if they have to study. So, I mean, so this, this sort of, of works. Uh, or in groups. Um, again, some of them, can, as you can see, some of the resources are, are repeated because they can um, use them. Um. Yeah. Um, it's, okay. Um, they, sh they share their prior knowledge in small groups. Okay. This is sort of a warming up for a lesson when you are starting a new topic. So you present an overview of the topic of the following lesson and you form small groups, and then they, have, they, they are given the task of exchanging their prior knowledge about the topic, and then one speaker uh, designated by one, of, uh, by one group presents a, a summary of the results. I mean, I think we use it, uh, or even with not new lessons, new contests, but in, in general, or don't, don't you do it sometimes? I do, I mean, sometimes I say, okay, can you explain this concept to the rest of the class? Or who could explain this with his hair on words? So I think this is actually we we do it. So some some of these we, um, we we can be adapted and we do it in in different ways. Out of class um, can be infographics. They can work the, the of course the posters or the concept maps uh, to study. Maybe concept maps is better when they have to prepare for an exam so that they have all the concepts. Or, or projects, okay, with, well, this is more, more time consuming to be um, um, put into practice because it's uh, with artificial intelligence uh, or expert uh, interview as, as to, to some experts, uh, do some research out of the class, peer teaching, peer assessment. Uh, well, well, I don't know in your universities, but they don't really like peer assessment. Do you? Do your study? They don't really like be assessed by their classmates. I think it's in general, is it?
Um, and now it's in a fashion, the educational escape room. Um, I think it's a treasure hunt, the traditional treasure hunts uh, for us. Um, it is also very, um, they, they like it very much, but it's also time consuming for the teacher. But uh, if the contents are, are um, hard, they, we can also always propose um, this and, and search for some clues um, and find out the answers. Um, I, I did, we did it, for example, uh, with, um, to take about history, and we, we took them to a, a very old castle, and they had to, every room, it was from Gaudi, uh, architect, and it was a very little one, and they had to go from one, uh, but again, it was real, okay, in a real place, so they had to go from one room to the other and learn about architecture, about design, about so different, and they really learn a lot. They not only the history, the time, the 19th century, the, the um, but also architecture, but also art. So I mean, maybe you could take them out from the classroom sometimes, which I think now they are allowed to take them out and just uh, spend them, and uh, make sure that um, we not only have fun, but they, they also learn, and um, and that's it, and, and that's uh, our actually. Uh, I think uh, it was necessary because we know most of this, but I think what it was impossible, uh, it was um, what this project has uh, brought about is to compile all this in in, in a in single um, in a single website or in a single um, place. Because uh, I think it was needed to know yes. to know all of this and um, and compiling one single file. So, Two, two, two years. <laughs> well, it was many. It was many, many people. I mean, it was four universities. I mean, the project lasted two years. Uh, we had um, some other outputs, not only this, but the survival kit, but the GitHub. So every teacher. So, but it was many, many, many professors. But, but how many teachers? Lots, lots um, from the Polytechnic, mm, right? For, in, seven, eight more or less. So you can, so eight, eight teachers from the Poly, uh, from um, uh, tele telecommunication uh, uh, professors working on that GitHub mm -hmm. for months. No, 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 no,
recording yet, no? I uh, know you should be able to hear me. Ah, uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, sure.
Yeah, I can see you. Everything's fine. Uh, I used to, but not anymore. Yeah, no, no, it's perfect. Uh, I can see both. Yeah. Prawo. Mm -hmm. Ciemny ekran, ciemny ekran. To trzeba pewnie nacisnąć. Na tym, tak. Widzę. Hello. Oh,
zgłoszony nie bezpośrednio, tylko tak troszkę do wyżej, a potem głośność tak wystąpiła. Mikrofony też działają. Mm, no tak. A ja inżynier. It's not working, okay. Now it's better. So, it is true. Right now, it's for us teachers, it's sometimes very difficult to, well, to, to be active with some virtual environments. And these are also learning environments, not only, um, not only gaming environments, not only um, leisure and environment. So we would like to learn how we could improve our teaching, our learning processes on the basis of students' experiences. So please teach us something. Let us learn something from you this time, for the first time. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so, welcome on our debate. Uh, the topic of uh, our today session is, as you can see, what teachers can learn from students. And now, uh, I, Marek, Ola, Asia, and Rafał will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we would all like to teach you something, and that will be a nice try if uh, some of you will uh, take something from from the session uh, so the so we will start uh, so the the agenda is as as you can see uh, the fir first of all uh, we would like to have an open discussion uh, then we will proceed uh, to some of our ideas uh, which we will ha we ha we have uh, so yeah the first uh, step i would like to take is uh, to give you the, give you this uh, this little video. I don't know if uh, if I can turn it on. Uh, probably probably not. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, Rafa, if you would uh, be so kind and. Uh, As you can see, it's not that simple. Yeah, that's not not that simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th that's the. Uh, uh, that's the, our first uh, first idea uh, of uh, how how we can improve. Hi. Today I will be yeah. showing you how to connect your PC laptop to a projector. You will need a laptop, VGA cable, projector. Okay, no, no, no just kidding, just kidding. It's, <laughs> it's, 
uh, that's uh, in in Poland. I don't know if uh, in other countries uh, as well, but uh, here in Poland we have a, as, as students uh, we have a stereotypical uh, thing uh, of our professors that they uh, struggle uh, to uh, you know uh, make make the projector work. Uh, so that, that's only just a starter, and now we would like to ask you uh, if you, uh, how, what difficulties did you have uh, in the process of learning students? Because uh, you know you you can have uh, teaching students, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so what what? No, 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 no. That was just a starter. That was just a starter. I see a, ha I see a hand there. Okay, I'll, I'll give a suggestion. Think about how lazy and unmotivated the average <coughs> is, and now think half of them are lazier and less motivated than that. <laughs> uh, so, how do we get those students involved and actually wanting to learn? Yeah, just <laughs> okay, this is a great note. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I usually have problems with motivations with motivation between um, seven till eight, uh, seven a.m. till eight p.m. <laughs> yes. So that's that's for starters. Uh, I'd say that it depends, of course, on a student. Yeah, uh, everyone. Your students? Well, actually, I think the traditional methods of sort of dividing up the work for the students and sort of spoon feeding them the knowledge in little quantities and testing them as often as possible, uh, it works, but I think it, it doesn't build like self motivation. Uh, it's more like I don't know, sort of like gamification. Yeah, you have to have little levels. You have to have little power ups. Let me I just say, I right can, I can yeah. say that from the side of the students, most of the people who try to get higher educational level are motivated and ambitious. So I would say that something is in there. So you should dig 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 deeper uh, for that. Uh, motivation and engagement into the subject but we have some ideas that we will show you later how to genuinely uh, interest students in the subject we had said, uh, some uh, experience for the from the past what worked what didn't and what we can do something new uh, differently but we will take that questions, uh, question and when we will have idea that could help you out we will uh, we will like look at you <laughs> that's you <laughs> and about motivation based on my own experience and probably all of us there is no the most motivating thing is when deadline is really close so you know <laughs> that's easier to motivate yourself <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, just ideas. Ideas? <laughs> uh, just, just ideas. Let, let, let us uh, talk for, for a while. Yeah. For my online courses, usually students are hidden you know, behind this dark screen. What to do with? Just ask them to... Not always working. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't mind uh, having the camera on because I know when people are talking to you and they, they, they don't know if you're listening to them, it's very hard to, you know, there's no one up there, so you cannot yeah. teach, teach from them. It's sometimes really frustrating when you're talking to the, you know, dark yeah. stream, yeah. like nobody, when you ask some question, and they're like, hello, are you there? Are you still there? Are you alive? It sounds like talking to ghosts. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> Are you there? I think it would be just ask them to turn on their cameras. If they don't want to show the background because of some issues with the uh, facility, I would say, uh, the like, mess uh, in the background, just, they can just blur it out. So blur it out, choose the background. You can show your face or at least some of them who want to actively participate. 
and maybe some other tools to encourage them, give them pluses if they are showing exactly. up or something like that. If people don't just want to listen to the lecture from the car seat because you know this is available right now during the COVID times, fine. Okay, they are listening at least. But if they want to be active participant, then they should. Uh, you should ask them to be active. Just I think as simple as that. Give a oh, sorry. Uh, give additional points to the people that uh, turn on their camera because students have to be forcefully motivated to do something, as we I think all know nowadays. So let's say include a little bit of um, gamification and points point system. And for those who actively participate with their camera on, they get points. I, I do it like that. As in normal classes, if the uh, student is sitting in the front row and you are asking them questions, they are giving you good answers, you would uh, grade their um, performance, active performance during the lecture. So I think that shouldn't be much different than, um, than online classes. Uh, so. Yes, I would. I would ask. I know that not all of them uh, will be happy with it, but the the students who want to be there, they will do it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the turn, turned on camera is uh, something that uh, would drive uh, students to do something actually, because uh, uh, imagine ha imagine sitting in your in your uh, cozy uh, chair, uh, gaming chair, on your in your house. Uh, right, and you listen to uh, to a professor, which uh, tells you uh, really valuable uh, things. But uh, that's that's not not uh, you know students are lazy creatures, and uh, when uh, when there there are so ma so many things that that can distract you uh, in your in your house, uh, it it is easy. It is. No, it's hard actually uh, to keep their attention uh, to, to the to the screen. But it, when when you have the the mindset that somebody is watching you, as uh, in normal class, uh, as today maybe uh, as well, uh, you you all look at us. So you know that's that that is what drives us to you know keep uh, keep going. And uh, the same thing, uh, you know, uh, the same thing is. Uh, with online classes, uh, uh, same as uh, on the stationary lectures. I, had a, I have an idea that you can use. Uh, for example, during the lecture, maybe you can start without the cameras, but on a specific uh, picture in your lecture, everyone should turn off the cameras. Isn't it like, if you don't want to do it, then you have the minus. You should, you should be uh, listening more carefully, more <laughs> you know, like in the, some movies, there's some pop-up screen, and you you are surprised. So if they are like actively uh, listening and looking into the presentation, they will notice that. And if you give them instruction, instructions, they will follow it. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any any more difficulties? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and movies, you know, in games people sometimes lose lives. So what do you think about <laughs> So what do you think about kind of using plus points as you mentioned and maybe minus points as well? I'm not a psychologist, however I heard that uh, extravertic people should be um, should be punished. And introvertics should be um, should be rewarded, or vice versa. I mean, Google it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I heard it. So, I guess again, it depends uh, on the group, or well, to be specific on a student. But it's hard to uh, individualize. So I'd say on a group. And if um, positive, uh, re positive, uh, giving positive rewards work, then it's fine. But I you can also punish somehow some students, for example, lowering their grade or, I don't know, more homework, 
figure out the, figure I it out. I think you should ask them at the beginning if they are fine with the rules you you cre you have created, because if they are fine, they are accepting it. It's all ab about the communication. If they won't be fine, they will verbally verbally uh, tell it to you that this is not fine for them, and they will complain. But I think everything is based on the communication, and you should you should always keep it keep in mind that uh, if you tell them the rules at the beginning, they will remember them very very much. Uh, one thing I would like to mention uh, is that when you apply such rules and you give uh, negative credits to students when uh, they take, uh, let's say, the last place or, uh, or something like this. Uh, it's it's kind of unfair unless, if, if the students uh, are actually at, uh, at a good level. Uh, for example, what I mean is uh, when everybody is preparing for, uh, for the game for, to, to play uh, and they know they would uh, lose some points if they uh, get a last place, it's uh, kind of uh, the opposite uh, way uh, to deal with it. Uh, if you see, for example, uh, when one student is uh, just not performing uh, well uh, at, at, the, at the game, uh, so, for example, uh, is uh, on the last place and just doesn't care about it. Uh, y you can you can apply uh, such negative credits, but uh, if if its only measure is to uh, punish something uh, somebody uh, who is on the last place, it's. Uh, it, it has no, no, no sense because the person uh, that takes the last place, it highly dependent on uh, what score uh, does he really uh, get from this. And about uh, keeping students focus, one more thing. I had the classes drink which we had uh, in very, um, without any scam, oh, maybe that one, scheme. Him, okay, sorry. Without any scheme, we have during the ev almost every class a, li a short query with I don't know two questions probably yes or no. What's the answers and connected to the five uh, minutes before this query was uh, conducted, and because of that we tried to be focused for the whole class because we didn't know when exactly this query will appear. And based on that, even if we answer it wrong, we, it was discussed later, and even if we once answered it wrong, we had additional points because we were active during these classes and we at least tried to understand what's going on and take part in it. So maybe something like that. Not only because we, we are trying to reward us, because we try to be active at least and try to focus enough. So, uh, before we move on uh, to, our, uh, to our ideas, because we were talking now about uh, difficulties uh, and, and such, uh, but uh, we have uh, some ideas uh, which, uh, for which you can agree or disagree, uh, but uh, do you have any ideas or did you implement something uh, you know, uh, to your lectures, to your classes? No, no implementations, no? <laughs> I think that we could show them yeah, how to do yeah, that. We can just uh, move on to our <laughs> ideas, right? All right, so uh, the floor is yours. Uh, or at least some at least. first ideas. Yeah, yes. first ideas. Thank you. Uh, so, as, we, as my colleague Marek said, now we'd like to show you how we somehow would like you to approach us and at least, well, um, try to hel uh, help us to study uh, and help our future generations so that it's easier for each other to understand. Um, so, throughout my studies, I had um, uh, courses like mathematics, like uh, mechanical engineering, because I'm a student of mechanical engineering, um, and, and as such. And uh, I realized that in most of them, since 
they are very specific courses, there were softwares that really helped me to either work on some project or to, to understand some, some, uh, some definitions, some theories. So let me stress that you really should use um, specific and various tools that are for your course. And here I gave you some examples. Again, I'm a mechanical engineering engineer, so I had to mention CAD. Uh, I use SOLIDWORKS, but it's either. Um, another one would be for mathematics, very, very, very suitable and helpful GeoGebra. And uh, Stack Overflow, also very well known for um, IT guys. And last but not least, I guess the newest and quite controversial, let me say, OpenAI, so this, this monstrum that, le uh, that uh, answers any question that you, that you give it. Well, it's up to you if you would like to somehow implement it into your um, learning course. However, it may give you some notion, some, um, some let's say, uh, some thought to use this kind of things during your uh, learning. Another thing that I really like, and I knew even before starting uh, my studies here, is thinking outside the box. Um, let me say that I sometimes had a problem with my, um, with my teachers, even in high school. I was told that you have to do it like that. Why? Because it is like that. No, it's not like that. I found a way on how to do it differently. I know it's correct, and I want to do it differently. So why should I waste my time to go through this very complicated maze when I, get, when I can just go around it? The goal is, the goal is uh, uh, achieved, and well, you can say that um, I lost, um, how to say it, uh, I lost many experience that I could gain throughout the way. Um, what if I told you that I also gained experience, but a little bit different one, during my, um, my personal coming to the, to the, to the way that uh, I had to, uh, do it by myself. Um, for instance, example, because what would it be without an example? I know that in programming, in coding, always there are many ways to do one thing. Um, you can create an app that doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to be, uh, have to have buttons one to three, it can it could have three to one, because why not? Both are correct. So, just to conclude, be open and accept, uh, let's say, thinking outside the box and, and allow students to, um, to be creative. Creative, that's the word. And last but not least, we already mentioned that because it's super, I like it, um, gamification. So it's a, um, it's, a, um, it's a system of rewarding uh, student or punishing uh, students or people that uh, do something within the course. And here you see examples of our, from, taken from our uh, Mazure camp that we were. Below there's a very nice cap, cap with uh, sort of badges. These were rewards that we got uh, for doing some activity, for example, for uh, participating in some course or, I don't know, being in the, uh, serving in a kitchen. And believe me, they can, they can vouch for me. Believe me, it really motivated all of us to do those activities if we were to get these very tiny but super looking 
badges. And we could I pin can them. For him, yeah. yeah. And we could pin them on our cap or whatever we wanted. And then. Second. Uh, we were trying to build a Da Vinci bridge and uh, Gertruda tried to make a picture yeah. with an already built uh, bridge, but <laughs> somehow someone just. This is uh, generally a symbol of competition and failure. That <laughs> it sometimes, was built. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you need to lose to taste the win, <laughs> yes, probably. But um, may I add one thing, because suddenly uh, you will have uh, kids that uh, was, were ra raised during the COVID, and somehow they lost their, their um, opportunity to bond with uh, other people, with their uh, friends, because of the pandemic. And I think this is great uh, opportunity once again for them to have a like childish motivation in in learning and uh, creating them that bond we, with other students so you should keep in mind that suddenly they will come to the universities and they are um, robbed with some experience from the past yeah exactly um, as an example of this kind of a gamification, because I would like to borrow you too much, um, once I had a course, I think it was robotics, where gamification was implemented, and there was this very nice system where students uh, could uh, look for mistakes or errors in presentations, or whatever document was published by the teacher, and when they found uh, this mistake or error, uh, they could uh, show it to the teacher and then they could get points. And it was amazing because it made me uh, focus on reading and learning through these, all these documents because I knew that uh, I could find uh, this error and, uh, well, could get some points to increase my grade. And uh, I hope that you already saw an example that I applied gamification, this system here. I hope that uh, you could give me an answer what's wrong in this, in this, in this slide. Great, so you all get points. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Last but not least for, from me, no, that's Ola. In, yes, because when we are thinking about teaching, is every time it's that there is a teacher and someone who is uh, learning something and the problem is that there is pro almost every time we feel the distance between us like we don't feel that we can ask about everything we sometimes feel that we have to be a little um, reserved? reserved exactly a little reserved and t can't tell everything what we want because of a potential uh, punishment or something. So, you can pull out yourself, actually. Yes. And we are thinking that maybe to do a class is little more um, active, little more um, give us a chance to share what we think about topic, like a debate, like this one, <laughs> or just uh, give us option to be more interaction between us and to share what we think about the topic and what we know because sometimes we have some experience, some, um, some data, it's, uh, some, something that we know, have some knowledge and we can share it and maybe it's not the perfect fit to what is shown on the presentation but sometimes it's even better because we can sh see few points of view and it's easier to... No, no, I don't know Okay. Go on. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we can see the topic from different points of view. Okay. What happens when there is silence? You, we, um, we hope you will discuss, but then there is... I mean, that is not my problem, but, you know, you ask a question and there is no reply. Or you ask people to discuss things and they do it only when you approach it. Group. Otherwise,
Never mind. One time in high school, I had morning classes, and the teacher asked, us, "What is going on with you? You, you are not speaking to me. You are like deadly sitting." And she told us, "Just get up. We will do jumping jacks, and everyone will like try to do some exercise, and then sit down and talk to me because I cannot uh, conduct the classes like that." And we were like, "We like, are you sure we should do this?" And everyone was surprised and we did it anyway. Everyone was laughing and somehow she, um, she made us to be more active and that was very fun. I remember that till this day and it was uh, I think like 10 years ago and I really liked the, the classes because of that. She was looking at us and she was like, what is going on with you? You should be speaking, you usually do that. Just, what is going on? And we are like, oh, you know, it's Monday. And she was like, get up, we are doing some exercises. Shockwave, <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, uh, and we were laughing and that's how she created the bond with us. And that's how she, um, I don't know, like changed something with the, with the classes. Uh, I, I think that the idea of uh, you know uh, what lies behind those mysterious shortening the distance is actually uh, just um, how how you approach students because as uh, as students uh, when we see uh, you know uh, some doctor or professor who is uh, just uh, far higher than us uh, it's it's really stressful to to approach him uh, uh, first. But when when we can see uh, that he's just uh, a human as as we are, uh, not some mysterious uh, high level uh, being, uh, then it is it is easier just to communicate with each other with no stress applied. True. Yes. yes. Was, uh, at the beginning of my studies, I was stressed to address my teacher, my uh, teachers equal doctors or professors because I didn't know um, what title should I use so I said kind of <laughs> no 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 ah that's like another topic but sometimes sometimes believe me I had problems with calling somebody a professor because he or she wasn't yeah uh, continue How it influences the way you feel. Because I find it quite challenging that I can sense that the people, the students, are not comfortable with each other. And there is silence. I mean, I am very friendly, as you can see. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> but still, they wouldn't you know, be comfortable talking in front of their peers. Um, I could ask you some questions. For example, was it Monday, 8 a.m.? Yes. Okay, so that's for starters. So you should apply the system yes, that yes, Asha yes. mentioned. Great. Um, is the group big? I mean, how many students? No, I know because I, I serve with my students, right? They tell me I don't feel comfortable in this group. Oh, okay. I know that. So how to help them? Mm, maybe try to create the pairs of people and like. Uh, you can do some online um, survey that like help them help you to group them because there's some people who are less extrovert and maybe they will feel more comfortable and uh, encouraged to talk to themselves because they are have they have similar um, attitude. attitude and they feel like safer in that group, group of people. And people who are extrovert, they will be fine anyway. But maybe creating groups and, and try to bond them somehow. So they will be, yes? Do you like it when teachers give the group work to assessment on, based on, on, on group work? As you can see, I am extrovert. <laughs> and I am fine with uh, groups and I am fine with teamwork. Um, it was better if I could choose my, on my own my teammates, but I know uh, there's all 
in IFE we had um, students from the exchange and they didn't know us so I knew that this is uh, this is better for them to, to create the random groups and I was fine with it. Uh, sometimes I was surprised how fun the exchange students were so it was very good experience for their future. Um, but I know some people would like to have some division, like some of the great is individual work, some of the great is uh, teamwork. And I think uh, we have that mentioned later, you should always ask your audience what they are expect expecting from you. So if they have in mind that uh, picture of the subject that will, they will do something on their own, you should give that opportunity to them so they can work alone and be, uh, be the master of their time so they can, don't have communicate uh, every time. Because some people have better uh, communication skills and some don't have them. And this is not something wrong because there's plenty of uh, jobs outside that uh, the people, introverts are performing it better because they can focus, they, can, they are like working on their own, so that shouldn't be punished. But you should check how your group is looking like because if you have all the extroverts in the world in your classroom, so you should do what they are asking you to. <laughs> so basically. Uh, going back to your question, uh, it really depends, uh, in my opinion. Uh, do, you, uh, do you mean uh, long-term uh, group or sh projects or short-term? Because projects, on a, on the go going on for the whole semester, for example. Yeah, so it really depends. Uh, Asha was talking about as uh, uh, from the uh, extrovert point point of view, uh, so I can give you uh, an introvert point of view, and it's really different. Uh, so, for example, when uh, I have uh, when a teacher assembled uh, the groups, and I I was in a group with uh, some people that I don't know. Uh, it's in a, in a, it's in a, like in a job. Uh, you have to work with people that you don't know or don't like. It's, it, it's a real life, let's say. Uh, so that's the approach in a university. Uh, and s sometimes when uh, the people that you are cooperating with uh, are not so ambitious as you would like, you would expect them to, to be, it can be a disaster, believe me. <laughs> uh, so it really depends on uh, on the group. Uh, what what do they expect of you, of each other? Yeah, it's about attitude and about approach of people in the group. And I think also a good thing is to do some kind of uh, self assessment be between group members because not everything is visible during their presentation, for instance, or during the meetings, pro project meetings, because some people are introvert, extrovert, etc. And not everyone is showing what they actually did in the project. So some kind of self-assessment inside the group can be good to really see, because group members can see better who did what part of the project and how it looks like during the whole semester. There's always the problem of being respectful. And there with, sorry, just for a second. Self-assessment is not always nice. It, I mean, uh, sometimes when I worked in a group for, for a semester, um, and we all said, let's just give each other fives to, to have a better grade at the end. And I was like, wait, maybe that's not a good idea, but I lost demor democratically. So yeah, I, I didn't want to you know, discuss. Um, so I'd say scientifically, there should be done some research on self-assessments <laughs> because I don't know how to do it, how to solve, resolve it properly. Um, I the question, the we question. have a question. That's the thing I also wanted to ask you guys about. Do you think that it's more on the teacher's side to do something about it? Or should I delegate this to the group? If there's, for example, an uneven level of participation in the group, there's like 
like slackers that just don't want yeah. to get involved. There are people who are ambitious, want to take over De the group. Definitely, you should do it about it because we are we don't no, want to no. mess our rela relationship no. with. Yes. <laughs> this is no. this is the, the debate uh, because yeah. I would say I had that experience and I didn't say anything because I didn't want to harm my friend. But I was uh, very irritated during the whole process that she was uh, not doing everything. I, I, am a, I am quite a perfect, perfectionist, so it was very irritating for me if something wasn't done as good as I wanted. But from the, um, from some, because I already work like full-time job and now I can see that it was very helpful because now I also don't work with people that I chose by myself and I have to deal with it every day and it is it was great experience because I already know how to how to deal with the people uh, and I don't don't have to learn in my workplace so it was a better environment back then in my uh, uh, engineering course than in my workplace because I already know how to talk to the people and how to encourage them or, and how to accept that n not everything will go like as I, as I planned. So that is good. Uh, I have one suggestion about the peer assessment that I found out works in my classes. Okay. Uh, I don't give students just an opportunity to grade each other, like give each other a four or a five or so on. I give several smaller assessments, like for example, I give them a list of uh, students and I tell them rank these guys from the top participator to the least participator okay. in the group. Yeah? And you know, if the same person comes up last in everybody's mm -hmm. anonymous survey, I know this guy is clearly the the weakest link, yeah? If the same person comes out on top in all of the surveys, okay, I know this is the guy that's pulling their weight, yeah? So more uh, holistic version of the grades. Like or, or even uh, like pair assessments, yeah? I, I give two people, I, I, I like, it's, it's right now with all these tools, it's like extremely easy to generate like uh, Google Forms. And you, you, you give two students and you say, okay, which one of these do you think did more work on the project? Yeah. And if you, Another pair, which one did more work on the project, and so on and so on. And again, this builds up, once you analyze the data, it builds up a wonderful ranking. You can like right away say, okay, these guys are all like evenly distributed because like in everybody's survey, different person came up near the top, and, and different persons came up near the bottom. This means that like it's difficult for them to make a choice. But if the distribution is very clear, then you know you, know, you have you know who is carrying the group. <laughs> I wouldn't like to interrupt, however, we still have many more ideas that are great. So, all of you may continue, because it's getting a little bit of track. Yeah, we also thought about how to start the classes, like how to uh, somehow um, do us focus and uh, keep us focused during the whole class. So we thought about that the beginning of the classes is very important. And we, if we are starting with some kind of associations, some kind of connections with the pop culture, with culture in general, with things that we know from our daily life, even if it's connection to during, I don't know, doing some task and it's connection to some places or even daily situations, it's easier for us to imagine that and maybe <coughs> keep focus, yeah, memorize it and uh, remind it later because something was connected to our experience. Maybe next one. Okay, and as I already said in, in the previous discussion that you should know your, um, your students and uh, you know we had marketing before and one of the first things we uh, learned was that to uh, make a successful sales sale you should know your customer and you should treat us as your customers each year each generation is different and have different expect expect expectations from you so you should uh, prepare some survey it's like very easy in google form 
uh, to create such such a survey and the great thing we uh, we had in in some subject was leveling your knowledge because students don't want to learn the same thing uh, over and over and again so you should ask them what the skills already already have um, and one of the greatest idea is the exit, exit interview so students uh, won't be um, fearing that you will lower their grade based on their uh, exit interview if it will be done after the grade and you will explain them that this is uh, this is important for important for future group tell me what I have to improve they will uh, take you seriously and will give you some um, some feedback that you would like to have so that was one of our ideas and I would like to add one oh, thing to, to this uh, so in in summary uh, it is it would be great uh, not to teach us things that uh, we are already uh, taught. So, for example, if I, if in my English class I, I had, uh, for example, past tense, and I know the past tense, uh, and in your course uh, the past tense would be uh, also here. So, uh, on the first class you could uh, have some diagnostic test uh, to see uh, if they know it already, if, if most of them or, or all of them uh, are taught because uh, this, uh, the group of students would, uh, would have the same courses uh, before, uh, then if, uh, if they know about past tense, skip it. Why, why to waste your time, our time and the time uh, that university or school uh, is uh, giving you for, for this field? Yes, I know we are asking for a lot to change your program each year, but you know it will be worth it, really, really. It will be worth it if students will be more motivated and more encouraged into the classes if they will learn new things. If they already heard some of it, they will think, oh, I know everything about it. And they will immediately turn off from the from the classes because they already think they already know that and if you will try the different approach and give them new information they will be more motivated into the into the classes okay and our next idea is that you are asking students for example for mutual evaluation and we think you should ask each other because we have uh, full classroom of teachers who have great approaches and you should exchange that yearly uh, with other tutors how to approach your students do you think this program is okay would you would you understand everything from that program I think it is it is great idea and some brainstorming sessions among tutors would be would be amazing because I know the uh, out outcomes we have during our groups on CURS, uh, the brainstorming sessions give, uh, sessions give a lot, gave a lot, uh, a lot us, and we could switch our approach. We can think from other point of view about the topic. So that was very, very, very nice uh, idea to to exchange your knowledge. Okay. Okay, so uh, the ne next idea uh, is about uh, flipped education and peer tutoring. And uh, from my experience, peer tutoring uh, works uh, great, just great. Uh, I had a, a few courses that uh, were connected uh, with flipped education and peer tutoring. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, the great, uh, I think, success of my whole course uh, of electronic engineering. Uh, it was a digital system course and uh, uh, our teacher said, uh, okay, uh, pair up. Uh, get some colleague and work together uh, and you know you have to prepare yourself to uh, by using uh, additional uh, documents that are provided before uh, and on the class you don't actually uh, speak as a teacher uh, you just uh, supervise if uh, if students need some help additionally uh, or they're do doing just fine uh, so I, I think that when whenever uh, you just uh, give them the uh, you know 
uh, the fishing rod, uh, not the fish itself, uh, and you just uh, supervise them uh, in in their work, in their indivi not individual, but uh, uh, work in pairs. Uh, it would be it would be great. We are uh, working uh, as we would like to work, and you just uh, can relax on on your chair and uh, <laughs> uh, and and do actually uh, uh, less than uh, than you are doing on the uh, traditional lectures. Yeah. So that's it. And uh, actually, the uh, the last idea is kind of controversial, I think, because uh, does the pay more attention to more ambitious individuals? And uh, let me uh, first explain, uh, because uh, whenever uh, you are, for example, uh, watching an Amer American movie and there are these uh, on the high school level. Uh, we can see that the uh, teacher in America, teachers in America uh, are paying more uh, attention to uh, maybe not ambitious, more ambitious ones, uh, but uh, uh, simply uh, better ones. And th that's not the point. Uh, I mean for the ambitious, more ambitious individuals to pay more attention to, uh, because uh, whenever, uh, whenever you see that someone is just standing out, from from the whole group, uh, it is not worth to actually just give them more uh, work and demotivate them uh, from uh, from actually learning more, uh, but just give them uh, hints. Uh, let's say, uh, for example, on the academic level, uh, you could, uh, if you see that somebody is standing out, uh, you can. Uh, have some partnership, which would uh, ben Benjamin will uh, tell more uh, on the online session. Uh, but but yeah, I, I think that would be a great idea if uh, if you if you see that something uh, somebody is standing out, uh, just to uh, keep, pay more attention to to them and their needs. Uh, apart or actually apart from. Uh, uh, from other individuals, from whole the whole group, uh, I don't uh, under, I don't say uh, that you should uh, pay less attention to all of the group and pay pay uh, more attention uh, to the ambitious individuals. That's not the case. Uh, but yeah, that's. You know, I don't agree, but. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the that's the whole point of the debate, Asha. You can disagree. <laughs> yeah. But I guess that uh, Benjamin is waiting for us. Yeah. Yeah. So, because we have an, our friend from uh, Saarbrücken, yeah, and we'd like to switch to Teams now, because, hello, Benjamin. Yeah, hello. Great. Yeah, so or I can get some sound problems in between, but I could get issues. So, hello everyone from me as well. I'm a student from Sputin, from the uh, uh, I met those four students uh, from Poland as well in the Missouri Lakes camp. That was last summer, so I participated as well there in the gamification workshop. And now I am working at the RTBSA, so I uh, kind of got an insight into both worlds, the organization from the university side, from the teachers on one side, and the other side of the particip participants as well. Uh, so um, I would like to share two quick uh, thoughts with you. Um, one is about the already mentioned motivation problem. Uh, I think someone said it from the audience right at the beginning of the discussion. Um, in my opinion, the motivational problems uh, everyone experiences in class is the biggest issue we have right now in learning, in studying and teaching as well. Because one side sits in front of the class where are full of uninterested people, and the other people sit in the classroom and think, why am I here? Yeah. And I think this, of course, is a conflict that is hard to overcome. And I think the reason why this is the case right now with our motivated students is that we get caught at school thinking into boxes. The stuff we learn is separated into different topics, in different classes, in different modules. Yeah? And so we sit there 
and we simply work on one topic, we can rewrite one exam at the end, but there's no connection to it. You feel like you work on something and you work and you, yeah, even if you're not motivated, you try at least to do stuff, uh, someone more, the other one less, but that is not, that's the big picture. Yeah? You don't get to know why am I doing it, but is it really at the end of the day, like, oh, in my future life, why do I need that? And I think that's quite a common question. A lot of actually uh, just get asked daily, what do I need that? Why do we need to do this? Yeah. And it's sometimes very hard to find answers to those questions. So maybe you can sort of that in, in time. I know it's hard to find more connections in between topics, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, my idea about this. And one general thing is what especially teachers or the older generation should know about my generation and younger is that the complete lack of vision, this complete lack of motivation is something that's intrinsic. Yeah, it's not a problem that's exclusive to university. Um, most of the students are as unmotivated in their life as well as at university, you know? So it's like the common feeling we experience uh, before people I talk about this topic and I myself as well. And we have this as well at university, but the problem is somewhere else, you know, it's, it seems like a strategic problem. Uh, and I don't know if the university of, or if you, or you teach a class and we um, change that. Now, of course, we can make or we can try to give students the feeling of being welcome and to have good time, but this doesn't change the problem. It only applies to them, in my opinion. So, the second thing is that my thought on that. Uh, the second thing is about what I was asked to is to talk about uh, learning partnerships at universities. Uh, so, how can we uh, get in touch and keep the to contact as well with the university. In my opinion, to have a successful learning partnership that is based on three things. The first thing is the organization. I know organization is something you only get to see as a student when it doesn't work. Yeah. And then you ask why it can't be that why isn't this happening? What is the problem with this? And so you only get negative feedback when it doesn't work, but you don't get positive feedback when it does work. Um, so that's one thing. And in my opinion, the organization for the student at least should be minimalistic. And in fact, it's always easy to have standard procedures. You know, the first one to do this will probably have or experience a lot of struggles with organization. How do I get there? How do we do this? How do I get food? Uh, where do I live? How do I live? How do I pay rent? How do I to exchange money, etc. Yeah. And it's easy when there was already one day for you, they did it, and you can just follow after. So you should try to implement um, standard uh, standards that you can simply follow. Yeah. The, the next thing in my opinion is very important, especially to students, proper done marketing. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of students sometimes, sometimes know about certain exchange programs that happen and that you can participate in. But when the marketing is missing, then a lot of people don't see the benefit and I lack the motivation to participate. And I think things you can uh, market quite well is like a unique experience, a cultural exchange that is beneficial for as you as well as the university, and that is an opportunity to learn. Uh, and I think the best way to do it is from students who already participated in certain programs or exchange programs. So. And so the last thing I think that are important for students best to understand is that they can create networks. Yeah. I'm talking about connections between students and students. It's always nice to get in touch with people in your age, yes, from other countries, from other studying other subjects, and they live in different countries.
cultures and you know, maybe even after that exchange, for example, or the partnership program, you always can keep these contacts and uh, maybe go on vacation in a certain country and meet them again, stuff like that. Next, next important uh, connection is between students and teachers. I think it's beneficial when students meet other teachers from other universities that are not in the position to, to rate them somehow. If you see it like that, because it's over. when you talk to someone, you are dependent on, because he will rate you eventually, that always creates some barrier. Uh, and this one can be loosened, and you can talk to them about other opportunities. For example, I'm on a in Spain, and I can talk to Spanish, uh, to Spanish teachers. Oh, This is all best stuff. Benjamin, if you could switch your video off so that we could try and listen to you because there seems to be some problems with the audio. Yeah, I already mentioned that there are some, uh, some problems. And say something now. Yeah, do you hear me? Can you hear me now? Not quite. Not quite. Anyway, thank you for your input because we you gave us a lot of info on the on the subject and uh, apparently we have quite gone a little bit off from from the time that we should have finished. So I guess we need to sum up <coughs> somehow. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, Benjamin. Yeah, you're always welcome. Okay, so that would be pretty much it. Uh, thank you for your attendance. I hope uh, uh, you uh, you took some some values from uh, from our uh, approach, uh, from our ideas, uh, and how to implement it. And thank you for your attention. ideas how to make our classes more enjoyable for you, more attractive, more motivating. For sure, I, I will use at least some of them. Thank you very much. I won't use Kahoot all the time from now on. <laughs> it, was, it was the lesson I learned from Janet. It was like, use Kahoot, it will be a competition, you know, it's like, I did it all the time. And now I have some new tapes, so that's good. Yes, it's good. Okay, so thank you very much uh, once again. And this is for you. Yes, thank you. It is not, you know, like, thank you for being with us. Thank you for, you know, being at Missouri Camp. Thank you for sharing your experiences, for supporting us. Because it is important. We cannot do anything without you, without your participation, engagement, and so on. So thank you very much for all your efforts. And we will send also one to... Uh, Benjamin, yeah, so, catch, ah, one, yeah, okay, guys, now we need to conclude, to make it really quick, I will organize a very short and quick competition, so, um, yeah, I need this stuff, this is mazuli like stuff, so right now, to conclude, I, I, I'd like to make a list of conclusions. So Pavlinka, could you please help me with a board, digital board? Do you know how it works? Because I don't know it. Agnieszka. <laughs> yeah. Take the pen. OK. And I'd like to learn what you have learned today. At least one thing, one skill, one issue. Uh, I, I really do hope it was a fruitful day, very long day, very, you know, challenging and very, Yes, Niall, thank you for being first. Okay, very good. Very good. Aga, Pavlinka, where are you, Pavlinka? Pavlinka, it's gone. Okay, Niall, you can get one batch. So please come here and choose. And this is the rest of badges we had at the Missouri Lakes. 
And well, choose yeah, you know them. So you can take uh, one, you can choose. Thank you very much. And then you can choose because they are different, you know. What did you take? A tent, a tent very nice. Yeah. Where is a Copernic? Um, very nice, very nice uh, budget. Yes, thank you. Okay, what else? Yes, Marzenka. Ah, this is a yes. tricky thing. Yes. Yeah, yes, very good. Take your batch. <laughs> GitHub. <gasps> what happened? <laughs> okay, what else? I think that you should uh, pay more attention to your student. You, you should uh, uh, listen more because I have learned a lot listening to you. Great, thank you. Okay, great, Rosan. You get your batch. Yes. Okay. Always turn your camera on when you are online. <laughs> yeah, that's mine as well. Yes, please take your batch. Michal. Fear is a great motivator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can take yours. Great, great minds think alike. Consortium of universities and students all together. Yeah, yeah, very important. Yes, take your batch, Magda. Empowering your students really pays off. Yeah, yeah, very good. Take your part, Natalia. Use gamification in your classes. Yeah, very good. Take your batch. Who else? So, yes, make more workshops. Yeah. Andy, what about you? Would you like to get a batch? Technical University of Wuch is the best partner university we have. Ah, but that's what I wanted to. Yeah, who wants a batch? Yeah. Soraya. Revise assessment. Yeah. We, we have to revise assessments. Very good. Very important lesson. Who else? Who else? Very nice things. Very nice budgets. Very unique ones. Use gamification. Very good. Take your, take your badge. Who else? Who else? Paolo. Watching you. Make more online content. It will facilitate in case there is a pandemic. Okay, please take your badge. Paolo, watching you all the time. Keeping eye contact. <laughs> Me and you now. Being here again. Oh, <laughs> very good. Thank you much. <laughs> Janet, uh, now you. In my gamification uh, workshop, I've learned that you don't need to be make gamification complicated. And it could be simple. Role playing is gamification. Oh, that's what I learned as well. You Take your badge. <laughs> Yes, what you have learned? When a student has no energy, yeah. <laughs> make them to jump. Yeah, yeah, that's an important tip. Like jumping. Okay, take your batch. What do you have learned? At least one thing, one confidence, whatever. I will say the, uh, the first opinion of him that was that the students are extremely strange. <laughs> okay. Okay. You can take your batch. Okay. Who is missing? Yeah. Of course. So, what lesson you have learned from today? Coffee ideas is very good ideas. Nice. Well, actually, coffee ideas, pe people to people, yeah. it's something we would like to develop also to, to <clears throat> make students aware that this is not only important to focus on your, yes, of course, <laughs> on your own discipline, but also to work to get some perspective, other perspectives. So this is really fruitful. Looking at you. What about you? What do you have learned? You already get you. You. Uh, 
that students and teachers can always learn from each other no matter exactly thank you very much very so take your batch <laughs> take a big one because it was a big issue okay guys thank you once again for being with us today i, I do hope it was at least somehow fruitful for you the time spent here thank you once again our big e close team i mean the spanish team rosa soraya Sorry, I can Teresa. Teresa. Teresa, Frank, Andy Juncker, Niall, Natalia, Paolo, Gertruda, Monica, Piotr, Asha, Agnieszka, Paulina, Ada, of course. And last, thank you very much. Last but not least, my big inspiration, Janet. Thank you very much for coming. It is with Okay, guys, enjoy this afternoon and see you one day. Again, I hope to see you again here too. Maybe we will start a new project tomorrow. We will see. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>